This is the D6 Generation with your hosts, Craig Gallant. If you're getting any compensation, it's not charity. Russ Wakelin. You put me on a boat with freaking dragons attacking me and whatnot? Now we're talking. And Kurt Covert in the third chair. Frap and a hat. So that's how we're going to play it, huh? With contributions from Total Fangirl. Vampires do not sparkle. And our loyal listeners. Are you crazy? That's like 400 hours of gamer nonsense. Welcome to another edition of Rapid Fire, the roundtable discussion of all things gaming. Coming out of the speed of the righteous indignation and vigilante justice of the Red Sashes. Coming down on the vermin of the Dock Ward. Ooh. Today's edition is brought to you by Ranger Dave Ross, who likes to say thank you to Game On with Cody and John, 82 Common Gamer Podcasts. See you at Gen Con, enjoy those things you now have time for, and good night. I'm Geekly McNerdigan, your host today. As always, our panelists are Russ Wiven Vapor Wakeland what? and Smirk and Dagger Paramount Instigator and Stabber in Chief Kurt Kedala Covert. Let's begin. <laughs> Issue number one, known as the City of Splendors or the Crown of the North, the City of Waterdeep is one of the chiefest cities in all of Thaerun. Named for its excellent deep water harbor, Waterdeep is a hub of trading from all of the surrounding lands for hundreds of miles around. The city is ruled by a secret cabal of noble lords referred to only as the Lords of Waterdeep. Question. Of the following, who is the only current lore, open Lord of Waterdeep? Kerrigan the Arcanist, Pierre Giron the Paladin Son, mm-hmm. Dagolt Never Remember, Never Remember, <laughs> or Mert the Moneylender. Robillard Russ. I'm going to go with Littlefinger for 100. Clangadin Kurt. Number two. Number two, that would be Pierre Garon the Paladin Son. Why? That unfortunately makes you both wrong! Dagult never remember. <laughs> of course, open Lord of Waterdeep and Lord Protector of Neverwinter. Sheesh! Never mind that almost every one of those in some website or another says that they're alive too. But anyway, issue number two. Crowdfunding, or alternately crowd financing, or equity crowdfunding, or crowdsourced capital, describes the collective cooperation, attention, and trust by people who network and pool their money and other resources together, usually via the internet, to support efforts initiated by other people or organizations. Question. One of the pioneers of crowdfunding in the music industry, British rock group Marillion, in 1997, raised how much money to fund an entire U.S. tour? Pete Troavis Wakeland. $1.7 $1.7 million. Million dollars. Mark Kelly Covert. I am saying $2.2 million. Oh, you guys have the cost of a U.S. tour way overrated. It is $60,000. No. <laughs> oh, Every dollar of which was raised without any effort from the band. Fans did it all without them even knowing about it, which unfortunately makes them very generous and you both wrong! Issue number three! A stereotype is a popular belief about specific types of individuals. The concepts of stereotype and prejudice are often confused with many other different meanings. Stereotypes are standardized and simplified conceptions of people based on some prior assumptions. Another name for stereotyping is bias. A bias is a tendency. Most of these are good, but sometimes stereotyping can turn into discrimination if we misinterpret a bias and act upon it in a negative manner question in what century was the term stereotype first used nina regenberg russ i'm gonna say when stereophonic sound came into play which is not a century <laughs> Milk <Milton Clay Kurt. laughs> the 17th century oh. <laughs> russ is wrong <laughs> But Kurt is right! Oh, wow. Actually, slightly off. It's actually the 1700s, but I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> Originally used in the printing industry to refer to exact copies, it wasn't until 1922 that it came into the standard social lexicon with today's meaning. It was a trick question, but only Ross got it wrong! Issue number four. Although currently there are no active thieves' guilds in Waterdeep due to the diligent work and greed of the hidden lords, the closest to a working guild was developed beneath the eyeballicious monster Xanathar, who created a network of agents and spies throughout the city until he was killed by Pyrgaron the Paladinson. Question. What is in the eye of the beholder? Runting Russ. A uh, little bit of that sleep you get in the morning or on the left-hand side there. So a little, little El Kalata Kurt. Uh, love. 
<laughs> Love is in the eye. Everywhere I look around. <clears throat> wow. And Sarek, the sentient longsword, of course, you fools. You're both wrong. <laughs> and Sarek, whose mighty intellect is only stymied by such great cogitations as the conjugation of the adjective dead. Or deader. More dead. Yeah, that's it for now. Thanks for listening and good night. This episode of the D6 Generation is brought to you by Gamesalute.com. Check out gaming news or find out what the new hotness is on Springboard. Gamesalute.com. And by Battle Foam, protecting your army so you don't have to. And the War Store, bringing the war to your door since 1999, and that is for a decade or more. And by Audible. Try the service, get a free book, and support the show. All by visiting audibletrial.com slash d6g. And by Geek Nation Tours. Rise up and join the Geek Nation touring the world at geeknationtours.com. And Wargame Soldiers and Strategy Magazine, making historical wargaming less scary and more fun. Hello! 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 And welcome to episode 101 of the D6 Generation. The D6 Generation 101, that is the D6 Generation for non-majors, so please flip your syllabus to page two. (laughs) I'm Russ Wakeland. I'm, I'm Craig Gallant. I'm Kurt Covert. Hey, Kurt. Yeah, hey, Kurt. Hey. Well, welcome back. Thanks, man. So we are Kurt, ex- yeah, very ahead, excited to have Kurt Covert of Smirk and Dagger Games here with us. Indeed. Indeed. Kurt, Thanks what for are we going to talk about today in episode 101? Uh, golly, as far as I know, we're going to be talking about our achievements in gaming. Of course. We're, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. You betcha. Um... Golly, what else? Are we? Oh, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, a game that we all played and uh, and uh, had some comments on, the Lords of Waterdeep. Ooh, the hotness. Yeah. Everybody's talking about yeah. Lords of Waterdeep. It's very hot Deep. right now. And uh, various and sundry, I believe, beyond that. Various is exactly yeah. right. Bits sundry. and pieces, as they say overseas. It is a good word. Thank you, Kurt. Now, um, before we go on, we just had a big contest episode, episode uh, 100 there. Thank you and, again and for it, all of our entrants. It, yes, it bears saying again, thank you all for taking such awesome... Uh, making such awesome efforts, taking all that time to put together those crazy, crazy pieces. So we're going to let everybody recover. A little, little recovery period now. We'll start a new contest up again soon. That was a lot of fun. We definitely want to do those little listener participation contests yeah, again. Those yeah, are, yeah. Those are good times. We let those slip. We let good, those slip in the confusion and the transition, and we want to get back on that. Maybe a little lighter one next time. Maybe haikus or something. You know? Well, I, I, that was my suggestion. I, I think haikus. I like it. I like it. Okay. So, uh, oh, and before we go on to achievements, we should also talk about where are we going soon, Craig? Uh, we're going to... Shot at me! Yeah, I think we're going was... to Adepticon 2012. Yes. Right. Crazy. By the time you hear our voices, we will uh, be uh, contemplating a very, very early flight is what we're going to be. Yeah, it's, we, I don't know about Russ. I'm going to be contemplating. We're going to crack a dawn. We're landing in Chicago at 7.45 a.m., so that means we're leaving Boston at god awful early is what that is basically. Yeah. yeah. Leaving uh, on a jet plane. Not not even yeah. going to sing it. That's yeah. how we're So so we're looking plane. forward to seeing everybody there and we're looking forward to the big board game night Sunday yeah. night. Find us will be in the giant enormous awesome hockey jerseys. If you're listening to the show on the way to Adepticon and you're thinking what am I going to do Sunday night late? You're going to come to our board game thing. Come you on gotta, down Sunday night. Yeah. Gotta, we got to make this huge. Yeah, please come down, say hi, play some games with us, win some games maybe, who knows, who can say. You know what we should do about the board game thing right now while we have him on. We should thank Kurt for all of his support. Indeed. Oh, well, you're very welcome. <laughs> thank you, Kurt. I only wish I could be there. Oh, we I wish you could be there too. in spirit. Do you uh, know, this is a piece of trivia that uh, longtime listeners may remember because I totally forgot it. The very first time I ever played Cutthroat Cabins was at... Adepticon. And lived to tell about it. And I lived yeah. to tell about it. Not only did I live to tell about it, but I bought it, I think, at Adepticon, which says a lot because you don't get any uh, discounts at the Adepticon. <laughs> uh, Adepticon's got, like, you know, normal real stores at Adepticon. And yeah. I went out and I bought it. And, um, yes, it was it was Andrew, privateer Andrew. Uh, That's right. Introduced me to it. Hartland. Hartland? Yeah, Hartland? Andrew Hartland. Yeah, yeah. And I haven't seen him in a long time. Oh, I just but saw it, him at TubbleCon. He was working like crazy. Working like uh, a dog. Was he? Was he? Yeah. 
Yeah, um, he always does. But anyway, yeah. So uh, for in my head, anyway, Smirk and Dagger Adepticon always goes together. And as of last year, an entire new generation of people have the same connection. Nice. <laughs> was awesome. <laughs> now, also, we, we want to talk about the Lost Chapters. We're going we through do. some very exciting times. We're now switching over to the brand new Lost Chapter system, which yep. you'll be able to announce hopefully next episode. Very excited about that. Uh, um, but in the meantime, you can still download the onesie twosie um, from the site or use the monthly subscription option. And we just recorded book 30 of the Lost Chapters. And, and That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of those. Kurt was happy to join us. Kurt, do you remember what we talked about in that Lost Chapter episode? I'm afraid I've, I've I've blanked it all out. It was very traumatizing. Well, it me. must it not have been that inspirational. I don't we think about... the donut got. I don't think he got a really good donut. He wanted a crawler. <laughs> a I, bad I donut. Those... A bad donut ruins your whole day. A bad yeah. crawler will ruin your lost chapters recording session. It really does. Well, we talked about games that inspired us when we were younger, right? Yeah. Games that we thought this was this just really got us. Clearly, into the hobby. there wasn't that much of an inspiration. Clearly, they were not that inspirational. Actually, they were pretty. Kurt had some great topic, great ones. No, there. It, it, it was actually a lot of fun to like really think back and um, and and think about you know as, as gamers, we've all had inspirations mm-hmm. uh, that you know made us who we are and the gamers that we are and the, the the games that we love and what we're attracted to. And there are those pivotal games in all our lives that you know kind of pave the way for for what's to come. And yeah, certainly, like, I think we all had those. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, like signposts to yeah. who we are today. I'm sure there's some that you, our listeners, will expect to hear that, and maybe a couple that you will not expect to hear. Uh-huh. So uh, give a listen and let us know what you think. Yeah. Uh, and now it's time for, what's it time for, Craig? Uh, it's probably somewhere along the lines of, um, oh, I don't know. Uh, Achievements It is time for Achievements in Gaming, and Achievements in Gaming is brought to you by... I say tally ho. Thanks to Craig, Brian, Miles, Dave, Ian, Matt, and all the other players of Myriad Games I met on my visit. I'll be back again soon for some more games. TTFN and Chalks Away, Scott. So, Kurt, what have you been playing? Why don't you go first here? Oh, all right. Well, uh, in preparation for uh, for today, I've... Uh I, I jumped into uh, Lords of Waterdeep. Mm-hmm. I ran out and bought a copy and uh, cracked it open and then uh, been through a couple sessions of it. Very nice. And nice. so uh, we're going to talk about that in a little bit, I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I just roll through here now? Oh, yeah, keep going. Don't start oh, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> you, you can highlight specific, yeah. you know, fun moments. All right, all right. Now, I also cracked the seal uh, and inhaled the new gameness of... Um, <laughs> Honestly, this title I probably should have made. This this <laughs> probably should have been created by me. It's entitled Epic Spell Wars of the Battle Wizards. Wow. With Mount Skull's Fire. Oh, nice. That does sound like a Smirk and Dagger game. <laughs> it really does. And, you know, I I was drawn in by, like, the, they've got this great art on the cover that reminds me of, like, some kind of whacked out, you know, Cartoon Network, uh, you know, late night show. Mm-hmm. And then there's all stuff on the back. You know, this... This is this is language right from the box. This is what hooked me. Tear each other limb from limb in an orgy of killing. <laughs> Here's another one. Rip your opponents a new one with insane spell combos. I, you know what? I just uh, I just I had to have it. Dude, that's sold. That is awesome. <laughs> I know. Down here near the UPC, it's like you know, attention contains spicy language and extreme cartoon violence. <laughs> well, are you sure you didn't? <laughs> You know what? I swear to God, I, I said, you know, I am looking in a mirror. Look at that. Um, and quite honestly, I thought gameplay was uh, was equally satisfying. Oh, nice. you, uh, you're basically putting together these um, spell combinations to do just that, to to rip each other from limb to limb and, and blow a, a psychic spell through someone's body. And it's, nice. Uh, it's a lot of fun. All, all, the, all the cards kind of link visually as, as well as thematically. So you kind of tell the story of the nasty spell that you're, you're throwing at someone. Nice. Uh, I, this re- a, I, I recommend this one. That was fun. Is this a fast light game? Because sometimes those silly games I'll stay there. Welcome. Is it kind of a fast, quick one? Uh, it is actually. It, it's a, it's a fast, quick one. You you basically play three games right in a row to oh, see wow. who's gonna, who's the champion, and it's uh, brought to you by the fine folks at Cryptozoic. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh-huh. Yep. Um, also, I uh, I dug in recently to uh, Red Dragon Inn. Um, that's Ooh. from our friends over at Slugfest. I've always uh, wanted to play that. How was that? You know what? They're they're dear dear friends of mine, and we started our adventure in gaming together. Uh, you know, the same year basically. And Red Dragon Inn was one of their you know one of their early titles, which for whatever reason I never got a chance to sit down and play. And I I recently played it, and I've been playing it a, a little bit. It's a lot of fun. 
Nice. Um, interestingly enough, this is a game that um, our, our common fans, and we tend to have all the same fans, they like to sit down with uh, an evening of Cutthroat Caverns followed by Red Dragon Inn. So it's like the nastiness of the dungeon followed <laughs> by all the bragging about it, the drinking about it, and the gambling over it. Um, at the end. At the end. That's so. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> But uh, yeah, that's it's a lot of fun, and and truly, it's about what happens after the day's adventuring. Uh, there is there is gambling, there is drinking, and there is brawling, and you're just trying to stay conscious. So good nice. times. Nice. <laughs> that sounds um, good. On top of that, um, the other stuff I've been playing is is actually they're all like board game apps Ooh, on, look at uh, you. on the iPad or, or iPhone. So I've been playing a lot of Ascension. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been playing some Brawl, the uh, the uh, James Ernest classic. And um, and Elder Sign, I've been playing a little bit too. Yeah, how do you like the Elder Sign app? Uh, you know what? Um, I've heard a lot of people, you know, kind of down on the actual board game here and there. But I thought the app, you know, I was just playing solo mode, and I thought it was really engaging. I had a good time with it. It's it's I, I found it you know a little challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, you know it's hard to get the dice rolls to to roll your way sometimes. But um, but yeah, I thought it was. It's beautifully designed. It's just gorgeous to look at, and it's a lot of fun. Nice. Oh, nice. Very nice. How about you, Craig? What have you been working on there? Well, let's see. Uh, I've been playing lots of Lords of Waterdeep. Nice. I have two more games under my belt. I actually got Karen to play twice, so you nice. know it's good. If, uh, you know she likes it if she'll play it a second time. Uh, so I've had two two-player games, and at the other end of the spectrum, I've had two more five-player games in the last two weeks. So four more times Lords of Waterdeep. Whoa. Um, Ian, it was a cl- we had a classic Ian moment last <laughs> night. Yeah. Uh, Ian hadn't played just because the ske- he he wanted to. He wanted to play it at, at PaddyCon. Uh, his schedule, he, like he left right before it start. It came out, and he returned right after we put it away. Uh, he's been he's a huge D and D fan from way back. He he was he's the first person I've sat down with and actually knew all the connections and knew all the characters all the fluff, and knew yeah. all the background and like he would look at a building and go, oh my god, that's like the coolest building. <laughs> Seriously, that's an actual build. So um, it was it was it was like awesome li- li- playing with Ian because it was one of those moments where. Sometimes Ian will just fall in love with a game and he'll buy it while you're playing it. And that's what happened last <laughs> night. Awesome. He literally, they had one copy left and he, he like grabbed it off the shelf when it, during a lull in the game when it wasn't his turn and held it for the rest of the game and bought it. <laughs> that's awesome. And, in, and he won. He won. Uh, nice. He won quite handily. And uh, so, yeah, so that was fun. Uh, played more Summoner Wars. Nice. Still love that game. It's so, the, well, the. <laughs> The two of these games really are awesome when they're played at the speed they're meant to be played at. Right, right. Uh, either of them just kind of when they bog down, you're just kind of like you're sucking the fun out of it. But um, <laughs> but when uh, when Summoner Wars is going fast and furious, and you're not oh I don't know hiding your summoner behind a wall for the entire you know but anyway <laughs> uh, awesome fun and uh, actually been uh, sailing the uncharted seas nice. again. And uh, put a couple more, uh, put a couple more marks on my Uncharted Seas um, log. Oh, very cool, Captain. So, what are you? What, what fleets are you playing right now? Uh, I played. Actually, I played Shroud Mages for the first time ever. We did a big mega battle two weeks ago mm-hmm. uh, to test a mission in, that I had in my head, and then I did another mission this week, and I wanted to go back to one of my own fleets, so I used the Thaneris Elves, nice. and uh, I played against Ian. Mm-hmm. And Ian had the Ralgard, and it was uh, it's a it's a really interesting mission because you start in a very weakened. You both start w- with a squadron in a very weak position usually, and if you pounce on it right at the beginning, you can kind of take go get in the lead. And uh, we both tried to do that, and it was it was miserable. I had so it's it's a board. It it emphasizes boarding assaults, mm-hmm. and I had I I. Three different times in the game, I board. I tr- I attempted to board. All three times, I had uh, numerical superiority during the boarding, and all three times he wiped me out completely. Wow! So we're we're including one where I had six guys and he had two. So you gotta work on those dice was, rolls, man. It was crazy <laughs> die roll. I mean, I kept wiping him out too. So by the end of the game, there were there were seven ships that were mm. completely empty of crew, just floating around. Wow. It was hilarious, and uh, it came down to literally one frigate. Uh, the game came down to one frigate, and I, wow. I squeaked it out, but it was a close one. So a lot of fun, a lot of fun on the uncharted seas. Where, where do I get a button that goes bloop? I, I didn't. 
After yeah, I, I have I gotten one. Punctuate, I don't know. You punctuate you know, all all your all your items with a bloop. I, I don't have a bloop button. I, I got your bloop. I got your bloop in there too, Kurt. It's hard to hear it when you're actually talking, though. Uh, don't worry, you've been blooped. Nice. Don't worry. We should also mention because we have had some emails lately. <laughs> What's that annoying sound during achievements? <laughs> that is the achievement sound. Right, and then someone's like, "Oh, I get it." <laughs> so, <laughs> so yes, this noise you hear. Not an accident. That's the achievement noise. <laughs> like somebody keeps getting an email. For those, for those of you who don't know about the Xbox, that's what that sound sounds like. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I, I had to have it explained to me. So, uh, Craig. So, where, yes. where, where do you play all these games? He asked with no I play of all of answer. these games at Myriad Games Manchester. Ooh. Not to be confused with another awesome location, Myriad Games Salem. Mm. However, the best location of all, of course, is MyriadGames.com. <laughs> That's right. But uh, get, Myriad Games is one of those just special uh, places that you only meet up with a few times in your life where you've got cool people and a really nice clean store and attentive staff that bend over backwards to make your uh, your gaming occur. Um, and it's just a great, great, great place that's really got everything you could possibly ask for. And, well, here's, more. and here's a great example. I walked in the store the other day and I forgot my copy of Lords of Waterdeep and I was ready to play and I was like, oh guys, I've got to be all excited about it. And Josh is like, you know what? I have my copy right here. This, the guy working, the, why don't you borrow my copy? And that's just how friendly and, and, uh, and nice, the folks there that work at Myriad are. They'll, they'll make sure they have a great game share system for that kind of situation. But the staff's just fantastic, and they know uh, they're, they're there for you in the hobby. Yeah, and so absolutely. that's and that's where I played my copy, my Lords of Waterdeep this time. I played uh, five times, um, and I played a, with a couple more five-player rounds. That game is fantastic. We'll talk about it more later, but it's awesome. Also, as Craig mentioned, I've been playing a lot of Summoner Wars myself, and I finally got to play a four-player Summoner Wars game, Craig. Oh, and how did that go? Ooh, it was cool because you know what they do. So, so four player summoner wars is really two teams of yeah. two, and so you you put two of the boards together, right? Yeah. And so now I'm I'm there with Keith, and we're up against Blake and Miles, and uh, and we're paired up. Now, what's interesting is you can cross the the board in the middle where the board meets in the center. Obviously, yeah. you know I can go from my side to, to Keith's side, and Keith come back to my side. But also, you can wrap off the right side of your board and come around the other guy's left hand side of the board. Really? Yeah, which is crazy cool because it really bizarre. It's actually yeah, but it's a nice balancing trick because now both edges of the board have impact on the game. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, so you yeah. can't like hide. There's no corner to hide in anymore. And you're not going to get like isolated. And the other nuance is during the build magic phase when you are taking cards from your hand and putting them into the magic pile. Yeah. You could elect to take cards out of your magic pile and put them into your ally's magic pile. Oh. So you can transfer energy to your ally if you're like sitting there going, I've got a really powerful hero in my hand. I could use two more magic points. And I'm like, okay, here you go. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, but gameplay is interesting too. It goes from, uh, it, inter- it interlocks between the, the player order interlocks. So uh-huh. it'll be player one from team A and then player one from team B and then player two from team A and then player two from team B. Oh. So you have this little zigzag thing going, which works great until one of your summoners dies. Because then the game doesn't end as soon as one summoner dies. But when that summoner dies, all of his army is removed from the board. He's out of the game. Uh oh! And it's two on one. And it's two on one. And because of the turn order, now at some point there's going to be two bad two opponents against one defender. So Ooh. at that point, I mean, you're pretty much have screwed up if you're in that situation anyway. But yeah. um, unless you've really got someone on the ropes and have a chance to quickly kill their their summoner, you're pretty much in trouble at that point. But it's uh-huh. it's a lot of fun. Adds the game to a whole new level. Doesn't make the game take that much longer as long as you said earlier. Your players are all playing at a nice clip. Yep. Uh, now, rec- do you is there a faction that you feel is more powerful? They all seem they really balanced to me, but last night a bunch of people were saying they thought one was more powerful. Well, I think I think they're definitely some are more nuanced than others. So uh-huh. I I think like many of these games, the veteran players, uh, if you're a new player, you might find that some of the more straightforward sort of charge forward and and you have lots of wound guys might be more powerful than. Then maybe the numerous but easy to kill dudes. Mm. Um, but for example, I got total. I think the filth faction is fantastic. Um, they're the brand new chaos faction, yeah. and I've won with them several times. But I played against Blake, and he's playing with the Benders, yeah. and just got into a rhythm where he was able to control my deck in a way that I couldn't ever draw any more cultists. Oh wow! And because I couldn't draw any more cultists, you, without cultists you can't turn you. The way the filth works is they start with a low number of cultists, they morph them, they they, they mutate them. Right. Yeah. So without yeah, any cultists yeah. on the table, you can't mutate. Uh-huh. And it was a mistake I made, and I got in this rut, and I couldn't get out of it. Wow. So if you were watching that game, you'd have thought the Benders were overpowerful. But I've seen games where the Benders just get wiped out because they, if you're playing an opponent like the uh, the, the Minotaur guys you like, 
Right. They don't really rely no, heavily no, on magic. I don't magic. like them. I've just been forced or, to play them. Right. So I don't know. What, what are the factions that people seem to think are the overpowered uh, ones? Fallen Kingdoms, which I don't get because I played them once and I couldn't. Oh, I could, Keith. I, yeah, Keith and I were actually the game we played. Keith was Fallen Kingdoms. I was Filth. Yeah. And we were slaughtered. I mean, it wasn't even close. Yeah. It was Benders I think, I mean, and uh, yeah, I don't, yeah. I, I, I think don't it, it depends. It. it depends on what you have to know. I mean, it all depends. I think a lot of it depends on your on your uh, on your skill set. So I think it's fun though because I, I, what I've seen is people see that and then all of a sudden they'll play something else and be like, oh, that's the next nasty one. So I, yeah. you know, your mileage may vary. But I, so far, I haven't really ran into the no, no. power deck. I'm still enjoying. Yeah. Um, also, there was this little convention here locally called PAX East, yeah, a little. which uh, had a blast. With. PAX East has become now my second favorite convention of the year. Uh, oh. After Gen Con, Gen Con, of course, is my favorite, mostly because it's big focus on board games. But what's nice about PAX is, a, it's local, um, which is great because I it's much cheaper for me to go. Uh, <laughs> but b, it's this massive convention for video games. But also now it's become even more than that, and now it's becoming a general convention. There's huge board game area. Wizards of the Coast is a huge presence there, showing off the latest D and D stuff. They had some massive panels there talking about D&D 5th edition and what they're doing with D&D next. And you could even on Friday night, if you're willing to wait in line long enough, you could get in and play test it live with them. Um, you could go. There was a big panel on Saturday afternoon talking about it. There was a huge gaming area for miniature games. Uh, cool Mini or Not was there. Uh, uh, Plaid Hat and Summoner Wars and Colby was there. Um, Fantasy Flight was there. Game Salute was there. All these major board game companies were there uh, in addition to... And they have the big board room, and even Wizards had the big gaming area, just like they do at um, Gen Con, where you could sit at tables and play D&D and all that stuff. So it's very much a general gaming convention, above and beyond the, of course, Microsoft's there, and, uh, and um, you know, BioWare's there, and all the big uh, video game companies are there as well. So it's really, if you're a general gamer, or, or, you know, you, you could do a lot worse than go to PAX. Um, some of the cool fact, things, I... I, I I'm kind of sad that I, that I missed it. Um, we had a great... Uh, a great time last year. We had a booth last year. Oh, really? Yeah, we we did it. We did a, a you know a great uh, a great little bit of, of, of business. We introduced mm-hmm. the game to a lot of people who hadn't really seen it before because uh-huh. you know you get a lot of video people, right? You know, video game people walking and then and but they're they're gamers like you know so they're like oh wow show me about that yeah right and it was it was it was really successful we thought but um, the problem for for me was. They couldn't avoid putting it on Easter weekend. Yeah, they, they they had a big that was a big challenge this year. I guess something happened with Boston when they were coordinating things. This is the only year that's going to happen. They say so. Next year's not going to be Easter again, which is good. Well, that, that's good because because <clears throat> yeah. uh, I, I I would have been I would have had my head handed to me if I tried to you know leave. Oh so. yeah, no, it was a big problem actually. And the con normally sells out, and it did sell out of three day passes and Friday and Saturday passes, but Sunday passes did not sell out this year for for obvious reasons. But what was interesting about uh, Kurt, you mentioned this too in the board gamers is there's the big expo room where all the video game vendors are. That room is like Gen Con's expo vendor hall. It closes at six. Right. But yeah. then the open board game area and where the board game vendors are, that's open till 2 a.m. And so people you know, stay up all night playing games. But the so what happens is you'll see this sea of people, like 70,000 people going in to the video games. But then when it closes, they all come back out and they're looking at all these board games. It's and great. It's great, and and there's just lines of them there checking all this stuff out, seeing how it works. And you know, the one year that Will Wheaton mentioned Small World in his in his keynote, all of a sudden Small World sold out of like every store within 50 miles. And so yep. it's real. I think video game players really do get the board game idea. They're starting to learn that there's this other cool hobby there too. So it's great to see the two hobbies coming together. Um, so I managed to score Fantasy Flight at a small booth there, and Dust Warfare, the book just released. Uh, and I got sucked in totally. I got the book. I'm getting all excited about it. I'll talk more about <laughs> the show in the future, but that is really cool. I also got a couple of the print and play packs for the Death Angel Space Hulk card game. Expanded my little thing there. Uh, and I mentioned Colby was there with uh, the folks from Plat Games, and they had all their factions, including a bunch of promo cards. Got a bunch of that. Got some for you too, Craig. I got to get this to you. Oh, cool. Um, Thank you. And um, oh, so <laughs> we're playing in. We're waiting for the D and D panel on Saturday because they're going to tell us all about what to do for fifth edition, right? So. We're sitting there, and a couple friends, or local friends, Will and uh, John, are in line there. And we tried to play um, Death Angel on the floor, but what happens at PAX is they're constantly ma- making you squish the lines forward, you know, so you move up, move up, keep the, keep room for everybody. So we couldn't ever get anything deployed to the floor without getting people stepping on it. So we switched over to pass and play with our various electronic devices. So Will breaks out, um, and here's a safety tip. I, I messed this up. So, so Will breaks out his iPad and puts Ticket to Ride on there. So we're, we're passing Ticket to Ride. I'm like, we could do two games at once while you're waiting. So I break out my iPhone, and I put <laughs> Labyrinth on it. 
which is a great little board game where you slide tiles around. Kurt, you ever played Labyrinth before? I, I have. In fact, I picked up the app as well. Oh, I like that game a lot. And the iPhone app's great. So here's the mistake I made, though. I set mine up to go counterclockwise, and they had set up the, tr- the Ticket to Ride app to go clockwise in our little group. So the, the pa- we're passing our phone and iPads in opposite directions. Don't do that. Just, just, just <laughs> not a wise move. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was fun. Trying to keep both games straight was pretty, pretty hilarious. Uh, so that was a great way to spend the, to pass the time. And then finally, um, ended the, uh, the weekend with a game of Survive with Ryan and his friends. It was nice meeting all his folks there. That was really, really nice. So um, a great way to That's end the evening. another fun game. Survive Escape from Atlantis is a great light game. You know, we'd sit down, but it's got just enough. Again, Kurt, it reminds me of one of you games. It's got the little sc- screw your neighbor element in there, right? Yeah. Where you just sort of all of a sudden like, why are you, why are you putting a shark next to my guy? What are you doing that for? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a great little game. So that was, that was my primary achievements there in gaming. Ah, oh, what Ooh. a nice little. Now, what about, what about modeling, Craig? You must have been doing something. Uh, I'm still working on the stuff I mentioned last show. Uh, <clears throat> I've put aside the uh, Covenant of Antarctica nice. now that I have them um, dry brushed enough that they kind of look done along with side with my other stuff. And I've been focusing on finishing a federated, federated States of America for Ooh. Dystopian Wars Dreadnought, three gunships, nice. six corvettes. Six escorts, Ooh. a large flyer, Ooh. a sky fortress, Ooh. and four John Henry robots. Wow. wow. All at the same time. So that's an awful, that's one, you know, four, that's 12, 16. Yeah, there's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of models. That is a lot of modeling. It is. So, uh, um, but I'm loving it. The models are just so cool. They're so rewarding as you're painting them. They are beautiful. They really are beautiful. Kurt, how about you? You doing any modeling? Oh, dudes. <laughs> Man, I... I tell you what. First of all, I have not dipped my little toe into the very different universe that is modeling. Uh, um, so th- that's with a face thing. like yours, I don't believe that. <laughs> well, I blush. <laughs> but no, honestly, uh, there, there'd be no way for me to, to even start because that that is uh, that's a major time commitment. And, yes. and honestly, yes, my is. time is going right into building games, and that's what uh, I've been doing. Well, achievement for game building. And we would much rather you do that, actually. Indeed. Yeah. Hey, can you can you can you give us any insight into some of the new games you're building, or is it still so secret? Oh yeah, no, no, that's all cool. Um, well, I don't think uh, I don't. I, I think the news is pretty much out on on this. Um, I have been working in earnest on getting uh, Cutthroat Caverns fresh meat oh, uh, to the table of everyone's uh, every fan's uh, table. So uh, this is really going to be an expansion of fans. For the fans, awesome, nice, um, and uh, it's 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 got it's got all the stuff that people have been basically begging us for, um, you know, for a, a couple of years now. And and the the biggest piece is that Fresh Meat is going to deliver new characters, and they're all going to be unique characters. Oh, nice. So unlike unlike uh, you know all the you know the 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 base game where they're just generic. Um, or even in Deeper and Darker, where we added like one ability to kind of make them different. Um, this is, um, you're going to get the six original characters with a flip side that actually changes their life totals and gives them preloaded abilities. Cool. There's going to be six all new characters with, Ooh. you know, they're, they're going to be, you know, all, all geared up for, uh, for, uh, for fun as well. And then the, the beautiful part about this um, is that, it allows for customization of characters, so you can flip all those characters over to a hundred points again, and you do a uh, an a ability draft where you draft the abilities that you think are going to really put you you know ahead to win, mm-hmm. but those abilities end up chipping away at your starting life total. Oh well. So you if you load up, you your your life drops. So so you're you're going in with more power, but uh, a little bit uh, a little bit less health. Nice. Yeah, Perfectly so cool. very cool. Uh, and honestly, I've been I've been going through and playing um, all the 113 uh, different uh, submissions we got through our uh, Cutthroat Caverns create a, an encounter contest. Oh, right, that's right. And lots of really really cool inspired ideas, um, but it took a lot of testing and uh, and a lot of um, you know kind of heavy lifting to take some of those really great inspirations and make them kind of balanced for uh, for the game. So that's that's been taking most of the time. Um, then uh, the other thing is that uh, we're developing 
well, developing. It's, you know, we're kind of breathing new life into a, a game that um, uh, we kind of discovered. It's, it's, a, it's a 12th century uh, game. <laughs> it's, uh, it comes out of ancient Japan, and it is the game uh, from, uh, from which the, uh, the Yakuza, the Japanese mafia, actually oh, get right. their name. Right. Oh, cool. Um, so it's um, it's a very almost zen like wagering game, which is a little bit like baccarat and blackjack, and uh, it's um, that sounds really cool, actually. Yeah, the the the, the deal kind of passes all around the table, so everyone gets gets a chance to be the dealer, um, and as the dealer, you have the the most risk and reward, um, and. Uh, well, I'm not going to go into the whole rules, but I mean, it's it's really it's steeped in a lot of really ancient tradition. Um, it's it plays a little bit unlike you know uh, a lot of more Western gambling games, so it does have a more Zen feel, and it's just gorgeous. The traditional art um, is is just amazing to look at, and we're uh, we're actually working with a Japanese brush artist to uh, uh, to re envision those a bit too. Nice. So yeah, so very very excited about that one. Very cool. That sounds oh. awesome. Well, that's. That's that's model. You're building stuff. So that counts as modeling. So yes, kind of. <laughs> uh, let's see. With my modeling, I'm I'm uh, I'm at a standstill for Project Luna. I, I need to. Um, this is my making uh, increasing the bling factor of uh, my Eclipse game. I need to get the Eclipse game in. I have to wait for the second printing because the second. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's a problem. That's a minor problem. Well, because I, I I'm I'm hesitant. I've got the basis now, and I've got the models. I think for two factions. But before I start gluing things together, making permanent. Size decisions. I need to f- see if they're going to fit on the tiles and get everything all worked out. So I kind of, I kind of need to do that. Now, also, I am now, as I mentioned earlier, Dust Warfare is on my radar, and that scared me a little bit. There's a lot of mo- this is a high model count game. Um, it's getting me back into army scale gaming, which I, I, I kind of miss. Um, the the good news about Dust is that the models aren't pre painted unless you're willing to pay obscene amounts of money, which I, which I'm not, but. They are. Um, they do come assembled and primed. So I'm. I'm starting to try to figure out what are the best techniques I can do to rapidly paint these guys. So they look decent, mm. <laughs> based on the primer patterns. So, um, so I know, I'm sure I'd get away with just some, you know, some flesh tones and and you know, painting the guns black and they wouldn't look bad. But then I'm trying to think: should I ink them, dry brush them? If the way we can see what they look like. But uh, now, is this just thought right now, or do you actually have some of these models? Well, I'm considering which ones I'm going to buy first. So tomorrow, actually, I'll be acquiring my first set of dust models. Uh-huh. Uh, so yeah, so this is really the the this is not really modeling. This is the acquisition phase of the project. <laughs> have, have you have you decided on a faction? Uh, well, I've decided I need to buy both both the factions uh, right now. Yeah, you got to kind of try to get people in. Yeah, I, I don't see um, a lot of our local groups getting into it, but I don't care. I like the I like the the, the subject matter and the rule set so much. Mm-hmm. I'm willing to, and it's affordable enough where I can get two decent sizes for probably the price of one large GW army, right? So I can. Right. It's not that prohibitive. There's a third faction coming out um, as well, the Soviets. Uh, I probably won't get those, uh, but someone else maybe will if I, you know, if I have other two. So maybe that'll work out. But, but um, yeah, so I'm pretty excited about that stuff, and we'll see what, how, how that goes. Gotcha. Cool. So, what about other Kurt? How about you go first? What have you been doing outside of gaming? That's sort of geeky. Oh, well, let's see. Just general geek interest stuff. Uh, well, uh, I took my family to go see uh, Hunger Games. What'd you think? Uh, you know what? Uh, my family and I really enjoyed it, um, and. Uh, my son, you know, was was champing at the bit, waiting to to get in to to see this. He's a big fan of the books, and he was pretty impressed with the with the way they 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 brought it to life. As was I. Well, um, you know, obviously they had to cut you know some some stuff, um, but I think a really nicely executed uh, version of the story. So that was kind of cool. Nice. Excellent. Cheers. And then in a in a similar uh, vein. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but every once in a while, I actually get in to take a peek at films in development. See, I did you not know this. You jerk. That's what that bullet point I'm looking is. at this bullet. I'm going, did this movie come out and I never heard of it? How did? How is this on his list? And Yes. And so, so here's the thing. <laughs> um, during Toy Fair every year, um, one of the things that I do is I, I, as I take meetings with all the film studios – uh, you know, you know, for my day job because I, I, I work with you know, uh, you know, kids clients and I try to find promotional tie-ins for movies and things like that. So studios want to talk to me, so I will talk to my clients on their behalf. Wow. Um, and uh, so I, I had a, a meeting with uh, with Lionsgate Films, mm-hmm. and they are bringing to the big screen um, a 
an absolute amazing story and, and a, a, a favorite of just, I don't know. Absolute. One of everybody. the classic. <laughs> one of the best classic. sci-fi books ever. Ender's Game. Oh. Oh. Achievements are going off the hook. Oh, my God. <laughs> and so that, that alone is pretty damn cool. That is awesome. But when I tell you that the itty-bitty tiny piece that I saw blew my mind. Oh, oh Kurt. I am Kurt, just you're saying. Me. And you're Kurt, killing me. You're killing Kurt, me. Kurt, Kurt, was I am it, so looking forward to this film. Was it the training scene in the, in the Zero G? It was zero G training footage. Oh, was he shooting between his legs with his laser? He's um, his laser. Basically, the the, oh. the the clip is uh, you know is is you know shot from the back. You see the the helmet being lowered on and you know snapped in place, and and off he goes. He just he Ender just takes a step and off he goes oh. sailing into the the center of the arena, and you just see him getting like prepped. His feet kind of come up and he's coming towards you, and you're just like. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Oh. Finally, this movie's been Get begging to be made forever. Just listening to you. I know. So, I know. Here's this. some other little bits. <laughs> uh, we are talking about uh, Harrison Ford. Ooh. And oh, <laughs> come on. Oh man, this is awesome. Keep ben going, keep Kingsley going. plays the uh, <laughs> the general from from Days Gone By. Oh man, <laughs> that is perfect. Ender's sister is played by oh uh, I'm I'm blanking on the name. It's the girl from um, True Grit with the braids. Oh, she was great. Oh, yeah, she was, she was great. Her, I know you're her, about. Name, I her name. She was awesome. Yep. Yep. And and Ender is being played by the uh, the the young actor who was um, uh, most recently in uh, Hugo. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. So. Stellar cast. The cartoon. Hugo was, was a sort of CGI movie. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, everything from production art all the way to this this uh, scene that I saw that all the all the uh, the special effects are being done by the same crew that just did Star Trek. Yeah. Abigail oh. Breslin is her name. There you yep. go. Oh man, Harris! Oh, look at that! Oh, Mazarek! Yep. Oh. Uh, he's on IMDb now. It's happening. I am just IMDb it. It's fucking insane. And, wow, uh, that's awesome. The, the other thing to say, um, they they shared this with me. Obviously, Ender's Game. I don't know if you know this, but it is required reading at every military academy. It is yes, yes, I knew that. Um, and obviously, because it's all about the the strategies of uh, of warfare. Mm-hmm. Um, so really doing a nice job of honoring that whole spirit, the producers are bringing General Petraeus and a whole bunch of other generals in to actually help choreograph the battle scenes. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> so awesome. these are going to be top-end generals that are actually going to be behind the, 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 the blocking out of all the scenes. Oh, oh man. Oh, that is oh, so man. awesome, Kurt. That Well, that was awesome. That, I did not expect that little nugget. That's amazing. Yeah, so, so look forward to that. That That's... Um, I, God, I'm trying to remember. I think it's I think it's two two years away. Oh, wow. it says November 2013. Well, on you got for that. That was amazing, Kurt. That's awesome. Okay, you, you just uh, at the same time you made my day and crushed my spirit. Uh, well, I like to please. <laughs> <laughs> typical typical smirk and dagger. That's right. Smile while he stabs you. <laughs> so. Um, I had uh, a chance to uh, to pick up uh, Bone Shaker, uh, one of uh, Sherry Priest's novels. I really enjoyed that book. Steampunk zombie airship yeah. adventure. What do you think? You right. liking it? Uh, I am. Um, it took me just a little bit to get into, mm-hmm. um, but um, but I mean, you know, she, I mean, she basically kind of created a, a lot of the the genre, right? So. Um, I, and I and I think it, it you know it's it's got like the the right feel and you're mm-hmm. you know you're just you kind of you're along for the ride it's kind of neat yeah I've enjoyed all three of the books I've read there's one more I need to read but I, the, the first yeah. three I really liked I would recommend reading and not listening to that last one <laughs> but that's just me I got through it, it was <laughs> I read the first three and then I listened to the next one and I was like oh my god it it killed me but anyway really ah. it's, it's good 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 to read those Cheers are good to read. Yeah. And then, um, because I have so much free time, um, <laughs> that that's that's a joke. Um, I, I I got it in my head to write a novel. And oh, so nice! I'm doing that also. Wow, oh, nice, nice. Yeah. nice. Um, this is it's actually a uh, it's a young adult uh, novel, and why it is it called. Be? Of course, why wouldn't it? Actually, it didn't used to be, which wow. is the interesting thing. 
Yeah. Um, I had written um, for uh, I'd written a short story a while back um, for uh, a, a, an anthology called uh, of Dyson Pen, oh. and it was um, it was uh, an interesting anthology in that um, the idea of the the publisher had was to get game designers to write a short story mm-hmm. because he felt like hey you know game designers are storytellers at heart. And so everyone from Gary Gygax to myself to a bunch of other folks, you know, all like threw in short stories in this book. Oh, very cool. Yeah, it was neat. Um, and uh, the the publisher said, you know, when he when he read my story, he's like, "Geez, you might think about a little bit longer form." It seems like this has got a, a bunch of tooth to it. So uh, it was it's basically uh, it was a, a story about um, psychic espionage. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. And, um, so, um, I, you know, I started, I started writing and this is like two years ago now I started, started writing. I got about three chapters in and, um, around that time I, I saw, uh, the first, the first trailers pop up for, um, Inception. Oh, right. Ah. Yeah. And, you know, it was, I, I didn't know anything about it other than what I saw in the trailer. Um, had no idea what the story was, but I was like, you know, thematically it was just I thought too close. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to shelve it. You know, I, it's why, why, why try to fight against like a big Hollywood machine, which of course it was. Right. Mm. Um, but you know, just recently at uh, Thanksgiving, this, this past Thanksgiving, I, I was uh, meeting with a friend and they said, Hey, you know what? You should, uh, you should think about rethinking and recasting and recalibrating that story. And, Make it a young adult novel. Ch- ah. Change your adult cast into a young cast, and the ch- the, the the changes you're going to have to make are going to so far pull it away from you know right. anything it was is um, is just going to like you know put you where you need to be. And I, so I was like, that's a smart idea. So I started doing it, and it's just been flowing out of me. So I'm halfway through. So it's nice, great. very cool. yeah. very cool. Yeah, it's called Sidejack. Sidejack. Oh, I like the title. Sounds good. That's cool. Uh, let's see. Well, I'll go next. Very cool. I, I, you, um, go, you go next. Yeah, I uh, we talked about PAX already. Um, ben, st- people keep emailing me, are you still playing Star Wars The Old Republic? Yes, I am. I, I don't play very many hours a week, probably uh, two to three hours a week, just on the side, a little bit of fun. Still liking the game a lot, only level 31. Uh, I did get my little um, pet. They're coming out with pets in the next version, and I at, at PAX I got the special code for a pet um, Tauntaun, <laughs> little baby Ooh, Tauntaun. Tauntaun. Baby Tauntaun. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, you know, know, those smell pretty bad on the inside. They do on the outside too. Actually, <laughs> it turns out. Yeah. Um, also, still playing Mass Effect Three, um, and I've been getting lots of emails saying, "Watch out for the ending. The ending's awful. Whatever you do, don't finish the game. It'll ruin your whole Mass Effect experience." Well, <laughs> uh, apparently, Ma- uh, BioWare has heard you, and they have released free downloadable content that extend and "quote unquote" make the ending better. Oh uh, wow! I haven't gotten so to the ending yet. I'm not even. I'm not even a third of the way through the game yet. So I'm happily taking my time, and apparently I'm being rewarded for that. So that's fine. Uh, but thank you for the warnings. I'll go along. But yeah, you know, I'm kind of viewing the whole third game as the end. So I uh-huh. don't really. I think the last ten minutes. I don't really focus on the last ten minutes of a novel. If I like the whole book, and the last ten minutes. I don't are know. In, the last mm-hmm. ten minutes. The well, ten minutes. The last ten pages. Whatever. Yeah. The, the end of a novel can ruin it for you. Well, it's important, but at the same time, if I enjoy the ride. You know, if, you know I, I'm right. with you. I, I, I go along with, with the ride. You know, yeah. if, if the ending wasn't all that I had hoped for, but it was really beautifully told, I, I think that really counts for something. Yeah, I, I don't know. If I enjoy 500 pages Whatever. of the last four. Whatever, the two of you. <laughs> all right. Uh, also, ooh, here's the new hotness. So at, well, new old hotness for video game folks, at PAX, they were showing off Tribes Ascent. Now, Tribes is a we used to be called Star Siege Tribes, and this was a fantastic video game from the '90s, where you basically it was one of my first real hardcore online games I was playing. You know, in, the, in not I used counting. to go over to your house and watch. Yes, play it. I mean you had yeah. everybody had jetpacks and there were vehicles, and you had the the spin fuser was the, was the primary gun, which used these little spinning blue discs, and yeah. you'd be in the air. You're always on the bounce. It's like the old Starship Troopers books. You're never on the ground. You're always bouncing through the air. And the game also invented this concept of skiing, where your boots have. Uh, small uh, anti-grav jets in them so you can hover a couple centimeters off the ground and you basically slide frictionlessly down the hill so you can slide down the hill, get up a lot of speed as you get to the curvy part of it, you fire your jetpack, shoot way up in the air, blast the guy out of the air with a disc it's just really high speed, frenetic action um, anyway they've relaunched it, all new graphics uh, all kinds of new kill moves 
crazy new maps. They were showing it off at PAX, but now the beta, it actually, by the time you hear the show, it'll be live. And what's interesting about it is it's free to play. So you download the whole thing, you play online with friends. Uh, the game itself is free, but then as you want to get better gear and suits, you can work it up slowly with experience points, or you can drop five bucks here and five bucks there, and all of a sudden, you know, get the new gear you want. So you can sort of buy, pay as much or as little as you want to play, which is people have different feelings about that model, but it's kind of cool because you're basically getting a fully functional demo. Right, you're just not equipped in the best gear on the planet. That's all. So it's kind of cool if you want to try it out. I will warn you though, it is a very, very fast, and you need to be pretty accurate. And, and if you're if you're not into high velocity twitch shooters, it, you won't enjoy it. But if you are into that kind of thing, you will really like this game. It's definitely one of the fastest shooters you'll ever play. Really cool. Cool. Um, oh, and this goes back into my general technology theory. So my daughters, ever since about three days after Christmas, decided they wanted iPod touches, mm-hmm. and I told them, I said, well. First of all, you know, I'm not buying you an iPod Touch after Christmas. If you want to save your money up, that's your, you know, go ahead. Uh, So diligently, they saved every single penny, the two of them, for whatever they got. My youngest had a birthday. She saved all her money from that. Um, They started trying to do chores. They started bribing, you know, Nana to do whatever they could to get money. (laughs) They sent little cute notes to the Easter Bunny. Dear Easter Bunny, please leave less candy and some money and all this kind of (laughs) stuff. Um, So it turned out with the Easter Bunny's nice nice little bit extra and plus um, all the money they saved, um, they got just enough to buy these things uh, this past week. And it's funny because all their friends at school are now talking about these things, and m- many of them have them. And, you know, the, it used to be the Nintendo DS. But the thing is, the Nintendo DS is $169. The iPod mm. Touch is $195. Now you're thinking, well, it is a little more expensive, but a Nintendo DS game is $30. An iPod game is a dollar. Wow. So or free. Or, or free, yeah. or many of them are free, or even the super awesome ones are like five dollars, or because because wow. an iPod Touch fourth gen plays everything an iPhone plays. There's no difference functionally. In fact, it has everything an iPhone has. In addition to the fact that it plays games cheap, it also has a great uh, five megapixel camera or more. More I can't remember a really good display. It's got touch display. It's got texting. It's got all the features of the phone except for the actual phone. So what you're really getting for your kids is you know a great. Tool. It's also got web browsing and everything else. Of course, you got to be parentally you know, conscious of what they're doing with it. But at the same time, this great tool, and all the kids are using it now. So really, I mean, I, I love Nintendo as a company, but they got to really wake up. I, I think they're in real trouble. Uh, yeah, between the console that market, cool. the DSs, I, I don't know why you'd get a DS today. In fact, I was thinking about this at PAX. Last, the first year I went to PAX, 2010, everybody in line was playing DSs. They're playing Mario Kart with each other. They're holding up the DS. I'm in Mario Kart, and that kind of stuff. This year... I think I could count on one hand the number of times I saw someone playing DS. It was all uh, phones, either Androids or iPhones, playing stuff in line because it's just so much easier and more convenient. But yep. the kids loving it. That it's great because, and I got my daughters playing Hero Academy now, which is a great little strategy game with me. Um, draw something they're loving. You know, they're getting to that, drawing little pictures. Um, really great, great little mind games, and they're having a blast with it. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death they're going to drop it and crack it. But I told them, you drop it, you got to buy a new one. So, uh, <laughs> Start saving again. So that's it. Oh, and here's so Audible, right? Our friends at Audible. Um, we have a great deal at the D6 generation. Go to audibletrial.com slash D6G, our website, and click on the link to get a 30-day trial and a free credit. Yeah. And I would can't reco- beat the deal. And we're, get, we get email, we're getting emails a lot again, like in a new wave of, <laughs> holy crap, I just got a book for free because of the D6G. I mean, it's yeah. really a deal. You, you can't pass it So up. I'm saving my credit this month, and you should too, listeners. If you are a fan of the Dark Tower series by Stephen King, and I am a huge fan of that series, um, and you remember, Stephen King said this series is like his Jupiter and all his other novels. Most of his other novels revolve around or moons around this. Many, many of his, his books. Jupiter? Yeah. His, well, he, he, Stephen King's analogy is the Dark Tower series is his Jupiter of his works, and all of his other novels are moons around Jupiter. And in many of his uh-huh. other books, you know, Salem's Lot, um, uh, The Stand, there's all references to the Dark Tower. Because yeah. the Dark Tower is one of his first books. He wrote the whole thing. Anyway, kind of interesting. Uh-huh. But, but. He's finally. Although, he, uh, the other theory there is that he just kind of went back and mined all of his previous books for stuff. But you know, either way, uh, possibly. But they're they're pretty. Yeah, not, not a, that's not a theory. That's an impression. Yeah, right. But um, he he was supposedly done with it, but not anymore. He's releasing a new book. Uh, the new book is uh, "The Wind Through the Keyhole." Comes out April twenty fourth. And what's cool about Audible is the day it releases, it also comes out on Audible format uh, in on Audible, and it's read by Stephen King. Which is cool because Stephen King has read all the other Dark Tower books, and he hasn't read a book in a while. He's actually had other narrators do it, but this time he came back to that, which is nice because it's consistent with the rest of the works. Um, he actually is a really good narrator. He really gets into it. So, uh, nice. Um, yeah, so I'm very much looking forward to that. If you're a Dark Tower fan, uh, get excited, and Audible's a great way to get it day one. 
Mm, cool. So that's my my other achievements. Craig, what about you? Well, speaking of Audible, uh, I just finished Conspirata, which is Ooh. by Robert Harris. Uh, that's another um, novel of old, uh, of ancient Rome. It's the uh, the the novels that follow the adventures of Cicero, uh, who is basically the uh, primary political opponent of Caesar. So it's mm. it's 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 sort of like the opposite view of the narration that most people focus on when they're doing stories of ancient Rome, which is like, you know, hero, you know, uh, Caesar rising up and blah, blah, blah. And it, it's like it looking at Caesar from a totally different perspective. Um, I love it. Love it. It's one of those where by the, when it's done, you're like, Oh no. Cause there's a third one coming out. And like, I, I don't even think it's named yet. So it's, <laughs> uh, it's supposed to come out in 2012, but I, I want it now. Darn it. I did just do I in my research trying to find out when the next one's coming out. I found out that he did uh, another novel. Actually, his very first novel of ancient Rome is called Pompeii, mm-hmm. and it's from the point. Actually, you might like this, Russ. It's from the point of view of an engineer. Yeah, I've heard of this about Pompeii. Actually, I really want to read yeah, that one. Yeah, he gets sent to Naples to the Bay of Naples to find out why the uh, the aqueduct is going dry, and he thinks he's figured it out that something's going wrong with the springs at the foot of. Um, mount vesuvius and so he's going there and so he's like the one guy who's like something's wrong and everybody's like ah shut up (laughs) uh so it's uh i mean it's really captures and yeah that's that's my impression of ancient rome Uh, (laughs) "Ah, shut up um here's a violin really I'm really enjoying it. Uh, although in my research for the next book there i did stumble across several things about robert harris that made me go huh but um uh, uh, that's neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> having finished that, I went to my last acquisition from the last big sale that Audible had, which was uh, the sale that they had. Like almost every first book in a series was five bucks, mm-hmm. and the li- the last one I have now to, from that sale is Wicked, which is you know uh, what what the musical Wicked is based yeah, on. Yeah, I read that. I, I listened to that book. I have that on Audible also. What'd you think? I thought it was okay. I was yeah, that's like, what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I I enjoyed it. I thought it was interesting to get uh, that perspective of the story. I thought it was kind of yeah. neat. Um, yeah. I enjoyed it, but I I'd never seen the musical, so I I'd only read the book or listened to the book. I was I was underwhelmed by the musical, yeah, and sadly so because I usually like things of the along the theme that 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 this this is, is like sort of portrays. Yeah. Uh, but I went and I, I thought, you know what? I've been wanting to read Wicked, so I might as well just go ahead and get it when it was on sale. I, and you, you can't beat when you're getting a thirty dollar audio book for five bucks, right? And or free, depending on how you work it. And uh, and I'm listening to it now, and I'm kind of like, oh, it, it's like it's like walking the line between children's book and you know dropping the f bomb. And you're like, what? what? Yeah, it's kind of dark. It's trying to be like fairy tale but very dark yeah, at the same time. Very dark yeah. in a fairy tale kind of way. And it's, yeah. it's, I, it was, it's, it's different. It was, you know, because remember when it came out, there weren't as many. Th- I think it's more that no, kind yeah, of form is more was, common now. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. It's kind of the first book to do that, really. Yeah. Um, and I'm not disliking it. I'm just not liking it as much as I thought that I would. Sure. Uh, but speaking of liking something as much as you thought you would and tying it back in with you guys going, er, the end doesn't matter. It's the journey. <laughs> you're, all, well, you're all very Buddhist and Zen. <laughs> uh, uh, just finished Dan Abnett's latest uh, Horace Heresy book from the Black Library, No, No Fear. Easily the best Horace Heresy book in years. Oh, yeah. Wow. Awesome. Blew, it blows away. It, I, I'm a huge Space Wolf and Thousand Suns fan, and it blew away um, uh, the uh, the the Prospero Burns and um, and the the the, uh, the, um, the Space Wolf one whose name escapes me, which was written by Dan Abnett. I mean, it's just phenomenal. Uh, planetary assault by um, by the word bearers, and it's basically the entire. Ultramarines Legion has been brought together in one place under false pretenses. Oh, wow. Because they realized that horror, and that's like, that's, that's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Space Marines at that point in history because they weren't chapters yet. The Legions had hundreds of thousands of, uh, of Marines in each, in each Legion. And they're all brought together because they think the word bearers are their buddies still. And so uh, Hor- uh, Horus gives them orders, and they're like, oh, there's an orc over there. I need two full legions to take him out. <laughs> so the Ultramarines are like, well, this feels kind of like overkill, but okay, here we all are. And then all of a sudden, on a dime, the, the word bearers turn on them, and, and they're, they're, uh, they're conjuring demons. And 
I mean, it's a, let, let me just describe to you one scene that <laughs> shows the, how cool it is. The space docks are all full of the, the, in, the entire Ultramarines fleet. And during the attack, a grand cruiser, which is almost the size of a battleship, which in 40K means multiple, multiple, multiple com- kilometers long, falls out of its low orbital dock slowly like a majestic like ship slowly sinking and crashes tail first into the planet that's awesome and that and that crash takes like five chapters well now so, so, <laughs> it's unbelievable so you're saying the book's really good then yeah i'm saying it was phenomenal and th- but then it ended so abruptly i was like no but i guess apparently according to you two that shouldn't matter well i'm a little disappointed here craig because uh i'd love to have abnet on the show and and if we learned anything in episode 100, it's that you need to be brutally critical of an author to get him on the show here. Right. Oh, uh, if you're going to fawn all over him here, he's never going to come on. It sucked. It was awful. Uh, good. I right. hated it. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't even know if I, I – I can't even be that brutal as a joke. I don't, I don't, I th- I don't think that was me. Can okay. we get that voice analyzed? I, I don't think that was me. Right. So is that all your achievements? That's it. That's it. My, that's, that's my achievements. There's yeah. achievements. You're listening to the D6 Generation. Born to gain. And of course, the episode wouldn't be complete without us talking about our favorite miniatures transportation technology company, Battle Foam. Hoorah! Hoorah! Battle Foam's going to be at Adepticon, and we are looking forward to hanging out with uh, with Romeo. Although you don't get to hang out with him uh, too much at Adepticon. You know what my plan is, though? See, here's my plan. You know, ask you, me why you don't get to hang out too much. Why, with, why don't you uh, get to hang out with him too much? Because his family is from Chicago, and he goes to his mommy every night. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> nice. So, you nice. know, I mean, that's you got to get some of that home cooking. That's where your money goes, it. Romeo. We get to tease you I about your it. mommy. There you go. <laughs> so uh, I can't wait. But but I, I'm looking forward to seeing him, seeing all the cool new stuff that he's got. And what's this new thing you got written up here, Russ? Well, I am very excited. The new hotness I got involved with recently at PAX, I picked up the brand new Dust Warfare book. And mm-hmm. so I've been acquiring, like a mad, fiendish man with an obsession, Dust Tactics miniatures. And I got wow. huge piles of them. I just realized, literally just realized today, I'm like, how am I going to transport these around? I'm like... Oh, I better go to Battlefoam and make a custom tray. So I go to Battlefoam.com, and I'm like, well, there's no chance. He hasn't done dust trays. But sure enough, he's got all the trays pre-made for dust, including up to the brand new super heavy walkers. I'm like, Romeo, you are so awesome. So I'm I'm, going to get those, all those things. And when you go to Adepticon or a con where you know uh, that Battlefoam is going to be at, you got to get to their booth early because they sell them all the good stuff super quick because they just can't keep it on the the shelves. As soon as you see this stuff in person, you just want to buy it all. So get over there to their their booth at the con. The first thing I'm doing Friday is finding the Battlefoam booth and buying all the stuff I need. It's just going to happen. Wow. And foam is great to buy at cons because it's very, very light, so you squish it into your luggage and get it home easily. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so check that out. They've also got all kinds of stuff going on at Battle Foam lately. Uh, they got the Dark Age bags are ready to go. The uh, X-Board Fury Board for Privateer Press models is ready to go. Uh, all kinds of – and the Dual Con uh, is a 3-day Warhammer and War Machine Hordes gaming convention in Arizona this September at the Hilton Mesa. Mesa. So head on over there. Mesa or Mesa? I believe that's Mesa. Mesa. I don't know. I'm, I'm from the east. I don't understand these strange desert terms. Wow, don't blame us, man. <laughs> so uh, head on over there. Check that out for all that great stuff, too. And one of the grand prizes from that big tournament is a golden ticket to Adepticon 2013. I've got a golden ticket. So I've been, got a golden ticket. If you've been hearing us rattle on about how awesome Adepticon is and you're wishing you could go next year, the way you get a ticket is <laughs> we'll just fly out to Arizona. If you're near Mesa. <laughs> Step on head over your nearest Mesa. Right? Good luck finding Mesa. <laughs> it's, it's, it's spelled like Mesa, but it's pronounced Mesa on the map. Just look for that. Uh, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> and now... What's in the news with the shout out? No shout out. Just appreciate your good work. All the best, Trevor. Huh. Well, thank you, Trevor. We appreciate your listening and your contributions. And now the news up first. News just in from PAX East announced during the weekend and witnessed by Weekly with his camera. Oh, it's cool. I got pictures. Is the new D&D skirmish game called Dungeon Command. Dungeon Command is apparently a strategy game for two or more mi- players. It's a miniature combat game. The first of the sets will be called The Sting of Loth. And the interesting thing about these games is they will include new plastic models, 
Uh, some of these models may be recycled. You've seen them before. The exact same scale of the models found in the D&D board games, such as Ravenloft and uh, Wrath of a Shardalon. And these new sets will be two-player uh, combat games, but also any new monsters introduced in these games will include monster cards for use in the D&D dungeon crawling games. So a way to interlock and expand both games at once. Sort of an interesting idea. And speaking of dungeons, how about Dungeon Bowl? The folks at Cyanide Studios, the guys that make the Blood Bowl computer game, have announced they're working on a project called Dungeon Bowl. Blood Bowl hardcore fans will know that Dungeon Bowl is a variation of Blood Bowl that is played inside a, well, guess what, dungeon uh, with advanced rules that is very, very bloody. So apparently they'll be working on an expansion for the computer game that will do something similar. Well, enough about dungeons. How about ogres? Well, not exactly ogres. How about ogres from Steve Jackson's game, Ogre? A classic game in which a giant ogre-style tank thing drives along and tries to squish many little infantry troops. Ogre is a beloved old-school game and is being kickstarted by Steve Jackson Games and has already made over almost $200,000 in its production. If you're an Ogre fan, you might want to head over there and get a piece of that action. Uh, how about Stronghold Games? Well, very exciting news. Stronghold Games has been sending in some special love for the D6G Adepticon board game event happening this year at Adepticon 2012, about a week from when you hear this. Oh, we're very excited to have them. Yes, they'll actually premiering two board games before they're released. The Lost Temple and Revolver will both be available at Adepticon, the D60 board game event for playing as well as being given away as prizes. So if you're interested in either of those games and you're going to be in the Chicago area, you might want to swing by and say hi and check out Lost Temple and Revolver. Uh, other news, Fantasy Flight Games has given an update on the highly anticipated X-Wing fighter combat game. They have now stated that it's going to be releasing in summer of 2012. There's a lot more information now. The core set will be $39.95. And the X-Wing core set will include everything, quote, you need to begin your battle, such as 13 ship cards, featuring 9 Imperial and 4 Rebel pilots, 5 upgrade cards, and 3 fully assembled and painted models. From the pictures, it looks like 2 TIE Fighters and 1 X-Wing. Now, we know that doesn't sound like a lot of ships to actually do battle in, with, but fear not, because at the same time, they're also going to release expansion packs. In the initial wave of expansion packs, each pack, which is $15, $14.95, you'll be able to choose from the X-Wing expansion pack, which includes one X-Wing, and a variety of pilots, including the famous Wedge Antilles. If you want to go to the Imperial side, you can also buy a TIE Fighter expansion pack. Again, $15 bucks will get you one plastic TIE Fighter, and include a variety of pilots you can choose from, including the famous, well, I didn't really know about this one until uh, they mentioned it, Backstabber, who is apparently one of the co-pilots of Darth Vader at the Battle of Yavin. Now, if an advanced tie or tie advances more your cup of tea, don't worry, that's also available in its own pack for only fourteen ninety five. And of course, one of the pilots included in that pack is the man himself, Lord Vader, or Annie, as we like to call him around the house. And finally, if you want even more Star Wars action, of course, the Y Wing expansion pack is also available, same price fourteen ninety five, and that'll include the maybe not quite so famous, Horton Salm, who is the great leader for the Battle of Endor, as well as some other pilots to choose from as well. So Star Wars goodness coming this summer. Uh, keep an eye out for that. It sounds pretty exciting. And speaking of Star Wars, <coughs> Wakelin, what did you want to say about Star Wars Connect? Oh, Star Wars Connect, it's so much fun. Really, really, everybody's panning the game. No, they just don't understand the coolness of the dance system. What are you talking about, the dance system? Oh, yeah, there's Star Wars dancing. They're, wait, wait, wait. I thought the Star Wars Connect thing was... You do lightsaber duels and maybe some pod racing. Oh, yeah, but you get to dance the fa- fairly campy Star Wars music. Really? Campy? Campy Star Wars? Are these remakes of, of famous songs but with Star Wars words in them? Yeah, pretty much. is awesome. And, and, and you think this is good? Oh, yeah, yeah. Listen to this one. Actually, this is better than one of the ones in the game. Wait, wait, wait. This is Han Solo, isn't it? The Han Solo song that you've been raving about forever and listen to all the time when no one's looking. Yeah, that's it. You, you want to play a bit of it now? I Just a, just a little bit. Okay, so here it is, at Wakeland's insistence, and against my better judgment, the Han Solo song parody, originally done by MC Chris back in 2010, and can I just say, this version is much better than the variation that appears in Star Wars Connect. You can find more of MC Chris's work over at mcchris.com. What's that flashing? The illusion is a flicker shield. Both trap yourselves in, I'm going to make a jump to life speed. Blue milk on the rocks had to be tattooed
to be where they don't serve boys We're chillin' with some villain, cause we're calling unemployed No more kitchen rescue mission where we bought a child to fight It's no trouble, cause we smuggle if we find the prices right And on this particular night, me and my wokies playing hooky Wanna see the motor dough, maybe school technique and nookie See, I'm seeking out a sweet old on the run from the last one Talking matrimony, me and my homie for the fast one I'd rather chill with Spoiler Coy, the blonde with the crib Let me pimp for a minute, for a cash in my trip When you see the T head, then you know that it's on Noise, not the low, so they're playing my song I'ma be a space jockey, not a Gordy and a Morty I'm just a sharp shooting shot, always avoiding a Rodian I'm from the side, so we'll keep on Welcome back. Now, a little while ago, we had on uh, Stephen Bonacor, and he talked a little bit about Kickstarter, and it, it got a lot of discussions going, and, and a lot of us were thinking, I mean, everybody knows basically what Kickstarter is, but we got a lot of feedback that um, that Kickstarter is a lot more than, uh, you know, it, it seemed like Stephen uh, didn't really approve of it that much. And uh, we got a lot of people saying that, but it's great, it's great, we want to hear more about it. And so we've been thinking about this along the lines. And then we got to talking to our good friend, Kurt. Mm-hmm. Hello, Kurt. Well, hey. <laughs> <laughs> and Kurt is a big fan of Kickstarter. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Russ and I started digging and we did a little research and we looked back into the history of Kickstarter so that we could speak moderately intelligently or as intelligently as we ever talk about anything. Right. And... Uh, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to talk a little bit about Kickstarter. Not re- it actually looks kind of like a review for a game, but it's not. <laughs> um, and uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what Kurt looks at for Kickstarter and what, what his experiences have been and what he's looking for in the future and what he's looking at because uh, there's all kinds of really interesting stuff going on at Kickstarter right now. And in fact, there's a lot going on on Capitol Hill about Kickstarter right now. So it's mm. all kinds of interesting things oh, right yeah. now. We- we yeah. live in interesting times. Indeed. So, indeed we do. So let me first start with just a little bit of the background of Kickstarter, or as Russ wanted to call the segment, kicking it with Kickstarter. Right. So why don't you kick, um, kick it off there, Craig? I'm going to kick it off with Kickstarter. <laughs> kick, 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 seems, kick. This seems like you need a music bed to kind of set this up. We do. <laughs> yeah, I'm feeling it. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, founded in 2008 by three guys that you've never heard of before, Perry Chen, Yancey Strickler, and Charles Adler. This is based, where do you think, if you didn't look at it, you didn't know, Russ, where would you think something like Kickstarter would be based? I already know. You can't ask me. Ask Kurt I that know, question. but where would you think? No, Kurt knows. Oh, Silicon I, Valley, of course. I, I, yeah, I would have I guessed like San Fran. Yeah, yeah right. exactly. I, was, I totally thought, I was going on the assumption for years that it was some wacky California thing. Mm-hmm. But these guys are based in Manhattan. Ooh, you know what that makes this? What does that make this? The Manhattan Project. Yeah, Kurt, right there. <laughs> virtual high five. <laughs> okay. You probably missed out on the Manhattan Project. There you go. There you go. Okay. Uh, so what is Kickstarter in a nutshell? It's what they call crowdfunding, which is another one of those words that Russ makes up. Uh-huh. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So <laughs> that would be the cooperation and trust of people who network and pool their money and other resources together, usually via the Internet, to support, effort, to support efforts initiated by other people or organizations. So it's basically mm-hmm. you've got a cool idea, but you don't have the money. Mm-hmm. So you crowdfund it. You somehow go out into the – use the internet. You leverage the internet. Exactly. In order to um, change the uh, paradigm of funding. Mm-hmm. Those are big uh, words. You're gonna I know. To take I know. That down a little bit. Well, <laughs> basically what you're doing is you're getting cash from folks for stuff you want to do. Right. That I got. Okay, good. Uh, it was early, earliest use, I think most of us know, about like, the various charities that use the Internet. That, that, I mean, of, of course, there's our, the one we have the most experience with would be... Uh, what's that the thing we do in the fall there? <laughs> Extra Life. Extra Life, exactly. Uh-oh. Today, <laughs> playing the role of Rafe, will be Russ. <laughs> right. Okay, and then apparently uh, in the in in the uh, in the early part of the first decade of the century, you had uh, the music industry really started ex- uh, to look at it, leverage it. You had different groups leveraging mm-hmm. it to make or to finance first tours and then whole albums, and then you had the film industry starting with the French jump in there and start making g- gathering money from people who really wanted to support movies and, and, and specific types of movies to make the creation of, um, of, uh, of the production of specific movies that they now would are, be interested in. Were these all things that were being used for early Kickstarter, or are these just things like this Kickstarter? This is before Kickstarter. Okay, this, this is the early, early crowdfunding. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so, uh, so, so Kickstarter... Jumps in, and there's a there's several different versions going on out there. I mean, there's several different companies that do this. Mm-hmm. Kickstarter being obviously now the most famous, uh, and it started in 2008. And so, basically, how successful is it? it as through 2011, um, online, the best number I could come up with is 44 percent of the projects that go on Kickstarter. Are launched, so they call it a forty-four percent launch rate. Although their website has a little less than half currently, so that's about right. Uh, it's fair. It, it's, it's about right. It's right. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Nearly twenty thousand product projects that that translates to, and uh, there's been they they say on their website one hundred twenty-five million dollars total have been pledged, although. Delivered has been less. I found one news uh, report that was unattributed, but said it was around eighty million had been actually delivered. Wow, so we're talking a big yeah. This is a big deal. Now think, okay, they get five percent of everything that they. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, how do they make they their money? Pay. It's like they, eBay, right? They get a little, they get a little piece yeah, of, the, get, of the pie. They get five percent of every right. uh, of every project budget that gets mm-hmm. fully funded. Right. Okay. So that's that's a that's a nice little chunk of cash right there. Okay. Yeah, no, wonder, so, no wonder Congress no, is looking at them. What's, exactly. <laughs> yeah, whenever government right. smells money, they're like, how can we get some of that action? Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah, there's, it's, it's a very complicated and odd thing that's going on right now, and it's, like, it's, it's very odd. But, so we're not going to go there. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so how does it work, Russ? We just talked a little bit about where their money comes from. Uh, you go to kickstarter.com, and you click on the start your uh, website mm-hmm. button, and there you go. So what you have to do, though, you, uh, you have to submit your project ahead of time. And they have a very, very focused idea of kind of what they want. They want these things to be creative projects of some kind, and it's not, you're, not, you're not trying to fund one specific element of it. So it's not like, uh, you know, like, oh, I filmed my movie, but I can't edit it. I want to edit it. They, they don't want that. They right. want your Kickstarter 
project to be the whole project. The whole so enchilada, got, right. It's very much like grant writing in education. So you kind of have to frame everything in that more grandiose way. It's very much how the how the the community is going to uh, benefit from it and w- what kind of cool stuff you have on offer. Um and, and basically, you have to set several different specific things. You need to set your financial goal, which is extremely important because if you don't reach it, you get nothing. Right. So this is not like Shark Tank. You know, there's no <laughs> negotiation. There's, you've got, you, you set your number, and if you don't make it, nobody get, gives you any money. Uh, you have to set a deadline. So you've got a very specific time period that you're dealing with. So you're, you're fine. you have to meet that goal by the deadline, or it just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. And by the way, they recommend that deadline really be no longer than 30 days. Right, right, right. So, yeah, yeah this is point. not a long period of time that you've got to you do. do a six-month kickstart. No. Yeah. In fact, and, and that's another one of the things that they say is you should anticipate getting the majority of your money in the first five days if you do it the way they recommend. And then the rest of your 25 days or whatever you're going to and, have and I think that's going what to be a slow, steady drizzle. And I think, if I could just jump in, what, one of the most important things if you're going to try using Kickstarter is – Get all your ducks in a row before you try to launch your project. Yeah. So don't jump on there and just say, oh, this looks fun, and set one up, and then think, I'll add the videos later, I'll add the descriptions later, I'll add the different investment levels later. You really want to get all that stuff figured out up front. Yeah. So as the moment you put it up there, you've got all the information. Yeah, exactly. Right. And when Russ says the rewards or the, the, uh, the investor levels, what he's basically saying is this whole thing focuses around these um, – these rewards that you give to the supporters, the people who are going to give you money. And um, they rec- they've got all kinds of recommendations. They will never help you with these. With these uh, what, uh, Kurt, do you remember what they're called? They're not called rewards. I forget. Um, hmm, aren't they? I thought they were. They might, they might be. I don't know. I did all this yeah. with the website right in front of me. So um, let me. I'll go check that right now. I have a little faith in myself and assume that they're rewards. So, uh, so they they recommend you get like co- if it's a game, you get a copy of the game, or you might get a signed copy of the game, or you might get you know special gold plated pieces if you give certain amounts. Uh, one of the projects that I looked at, which was uh, I was I don't know why I was super intrigued by it, but I was super intrigued by it, was um, a a documentary about the um, the. Uh, um, the environmental impact of expanded industry in Mongolia. Mm-hmm. And it was like, for a dollar, you got like, uh, thanks a lot, you chump. And for five dollars, <laughs> you got like uh, a thank you on their website and a link to where you can like look at show notes. And then right. for twenty dollars, it was this and thirty dollars, it was this and forty dollars, it was this. And uh, and they had people donating all the way up to a thousand dollars. And for a thousand dollars, you got like, uh, you got a, 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 a Mongolian coat, and you got Mongolian boots, and you got a Mongolian hat, and you got Mongolian uh, woolen uh, socks, and you got—I mean, you got all this stuff. And the the only one that didn't get a lot of these have one, like the highest level is a single thing because you can limit how many people can give each yeah. type if you want. And uh, the, this one was you get everything that the one thousand person dollar the one thousand dollar person gave, and you get an associate producer credit in the movie. Yeah, and, it very much reminds me of. I think they actually. I don't think they call them rewards or pledge levels, but on the side of the website it says you know if you pledge five dollars you get this, you pledge ten dollars you get that, you pledge. Right, yeah, you pick yeah, those levels. They're, they're incentives. They're it's, incentives. It's like PBS, to to right? It's almost like if you donate this amount of money to PBS, you'll get an umbrella. It, it if you donate this much money, you'll get the umbrella kind of, and a seat. It's a lot cooler than that. I, it is cooler. Yes, but um, but yeah. Yeah, but it's it's very very neat. So, but you want to have it interesting. They say mugs don't sell uh, project products, and they've got all kinds of cool advice on their website. So, kind of the kind of things that you want to look at, signed copies or things well, like you, that. And if you bring it around to board games, right, Kurt? You, you, they, they throw things yeah. in there like you know, um, if you pledge at this level, you get the basic game. You pledge at this level, you get the basic game plus fancier meeples and that kind of stuff, right? Right. Or you know, th- the really successful levels are things where you get to have people impact your game, right? right. So um, you get to name the planets or we're going to put your face on one of the characters or, mm-hmm. you know, th- there's a lot of really inventive things that get pe- people really jazzed about being part of it. And really, I think that's what it's all about. It's not just the fact that I'm kind of pre-ordering the game. It's that my participation, I'm part of the process of getting this game produced and it's, gonna, it's only going to be around if I'm there 
right. it's only going to be what it is because of the input I'm helping to put in. Right. So yeah. I think okay. that, that that's really what's what's getting gamers involved. Yeah, and that, and there's a lot of really cool stuff like that out there where you get to help create characters or be a character and stuff like that. Um, so when your deadline is me- is met, though, if you don't have your money, the people who pledged money to you, they you don't that money doesn't get taken from them, and you get nothing. So the the goal the the key there is. Uh, you can't scale down depending on how much money you're you're making, and people don't have to worry about like you taking it, you you wanted ten thousand dollars, you got five, so you just took it and ran, and things like that, or doing a half donkey job uh, because you didn't get enough money. Uh, if the goal is met, however, you get the money is delivered. Now, Kickstarter is very careful to note on almost every page that they do not enforce the promises of any project managers. So they keep that. So this is very. I did a. I did a lot of digging actually because I was very very curious as to if there's a lot of fraud complaints and things like that. And there aren't a lot. You can find them if you dig. And but but my my impression, having done a lot of digging this afternoon, was that you're looking at a human community just like any other right. human community. So there are going to be jerks, and there are going to be not terribly bright people and you have to be smart where you put your money even on kickstarter so you've got to look at it and say well this looks really cool so i'm going to go for it and, and, and is it something that looks legitimate um interestingly enough one of the big fraud things was a occupy wall street um uh <laughs> journal so that was funny because there's nothing quite as amusing as uh as activists being angry at other activists that are on the same side <laughs> Well, I think what's interesting, too, here is this is where if you have any kind of rep- reputation at all, I think you can really leverage Kickstarter because if you, yeah, exactly. when we start talking about some of these success stories, you'll notice many of them have at least a small modicum of public awareness or fame, if you will, yeah. before they did their Kickstarter thing. Exactly. And yeah. so they were kind of like, you know who we are. We're going to try to do X, Y, Z. And yeah. from what you've dealt with us before, you kind of know. And this is what's great for, you know, maybe a small game publisher uh, to try it out, but who has, who's already had a successful product or someone who does, you know, well-known web comics Success- or whatever. Yeah, successful in one venue, right. then you can kind of, this makes it easier to leverage your right. current venue into something new. We I mean, think about the number of times uh, someone on a podcast or something say, we wish you guys would make X, Y, Z. Yeah. And you know, the, you as the as the person would be like, we'd love to do that, but we would need a certain amount of funding to get started. And who's going to put that up? And how are we? And the Kickstarter is a great way to say, look, okay, listeners, we want to do this X Y Z thing. You know, we're going to try it out there. If you guys really want to back it, if we make the five grand we need to launch this thing, we can do it. And that's right. that's really sort of yeah. the the yeah. idealized dream of the whole thing, right? You can work together with your with your uh, listener base or 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 fan base for a web comic or whatever and kind of easily build something out of it. Exactly. And so look so yeah, so I looked for a bunch of fraud stuff and I found one or two things what the one thing that actually they talk about as an example is there was a New York University film student who raised about $1800 saying he was going to make a student film and then he plagiarized someone else's film. Hmm. But that got taken care of and then they actually say you may have to go to court because of this, but it it is legally actionable if somebody says they're going to promise something and then they don't deliver but, it. That's what small it's, claims courts right. for, right? Yeah. But, exactly. it's but very, by and large, by and large uh, that's not really been an issue, I think. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I was trying to they they're saying they're warning you it's a potential problem, but it's not anywhere close to being anything like endemic or I mean it's just not a very common occurrence. Well think about eBay, right? I mean there, that can happen on eBay too. And yet on eBay, for the most part, a lot of people use eBay very effectively all the time, right? Right. So it's the same sort of thing. There's there's a small amount of. Well, pro- of I mean, one that- of the one of the complaints is that there's no. I mean, eBay has a lot of mechanisms now to well, either stop yeah, that or to right. pursue it if it happens. Right. And Kickstarter is basically a that's not our job kind of thing. Right. But I mean, like I said, you you go in there with your eyes open, you know, and you work with people who either have developed a reputation on Kickstarter or elsewhere. <laughs> And uh, and you're probably going to be okay. So let's look at some of these ex- success stories because some of them are awesome. Mm-hmm. And the coolest one, in, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> is the webcomic Order of the Stick. <laughs> right. Order of the Stick is awesome. 
I have been I, – I, it's gone on for so long that like I'll forget for a month and I'll go back to it and there's just too many to catch up on. So I have gotten hooked on it and then fallen away from it like four or five times in the past several years. Okay, but it's an awesome Dungeons and Dragons webcomic that everybody's literally stick figures, and it's just really, really funny and hilarious. And every time there's a change in the Dungeons and Dragons rule set, it's all addressed in the Order of the Stick comic. It's it's very, very, very funny. And they did a they they did a full print run of almost everything that they'd got going, and you could go out and you could buy the the the, the paperback big uh, graphic novels. It was really cool, and they they ran out of those printings and they didn't have any more money so they wanted to do a reprint. So they went on Kickstarter and they raised 2171% of the money they wanted to do this reprint. Wow. Which translated into 1.25 million dollars. Wow. Crazy. Which is crazy, which is a good time for us to say that yes indeed, if you have a really good, good idea, it can make more then you say you need right, yeah. and that's and that's. I mean, you're in you're, you're you're entitled to whatever you make is the cool thing, and you're obligated to do whatever it is you say you're going to do. So if I want to do a reprint of a book and it's going to cost me a hundred thousand dollars, and all of a sudden I got uh, you know a million dollars, well, there right there is an awful lot of your money. So well, you still uh, got to print a million, you know, as many copies. No, you've got to still it. print. The, right. I mean, you're going to do exactly what you're saying you want right. to do. But, you're but still now you've got money right. to do more things, which is right. cool. Right. Well, and, and often what they do to, uh, you know, if they've reached one goal and they're only five days into their 30-day campaign, mm-hmm. yeah. they might all of a sudden say, oh, you know what? If we can get to this next level, we're going to add this custom component that we couldn't afford before. Awesome. So yeah, yeah. Take us there. And then if that gets done, you know what? Now we're going to add an expansion um, that we we've, we've built. And if we get us to this next higher – threshold everyone gets the expansion and so it really that's how a lot of these get overfunded yeah yeah which is and that's i mean that's i think what might have happened with order of the stick is we're going to do one of the books and then they might have said okay if we get here we're going to do two of the books okay if we do here because uh i mean that's uh, order of the stick is awesome so that was cool now oddly enough when i first found order of the stick i also found the webcomic earth world which is another weird webcomic. I didn't like it quite as much as I liked Order of the Stick, but it's kind of a neat webcomic. And they did the same thing. They wanted a reprint, but not only that, but they boosted their, kind of like Kurt just said, they boosted their ultimate goal into uh, doing a new comic, doing a website for their mm-hmm. webcomic, reprinting all the book, getting merchandise, and built-in playtesting for a new game. It, they, they ended up making so much. So they... They made 354%, which ended up being Mm $84,000. But there's all kinds of other. D-Day Dice Board Game won a couple of design awards before they went. Again, it's key. You you go there with a little bit of background, and and, and it's going to boost your success rate. So this game had apparently won a couple of design awards before they went on Kickstarter. They ended up making $171,000, which was one th- over a, over 1,000% of what they were looking for. So that just kind of like sets you up for success right there. Uh, the most interesting one on the list, as far as I'm concerned, is the Idle Thumbs podcast. Oh, yeah. Wouldn't that be interesting? I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. Understand. I don't know. But, they, but it did make $136,000, and it makes me wonder what we're doing wrong. What did they, what did they, <laughs> what did they ask to do? Just start? Uh, they, wanted a, they, wanted a, uh, they wanted all new equipment, and they wanted oh, well. to do it right, quote. Unquote. What do they do? Build a, Trust, build a I say skyscraper? We quit, and I say we quit in a month from now. We say, tell everybody that's we want to do it right. That's a heck of a soundboard for 136K, I, dude. Well, <laughs> well, that's 450% of what they ask. Sure, for. sure. I'm just, so, yeah, that's but awesome. But still, that's, yeah. That, All right. You know what that is? That's like Howard Stern's studio. Yeah. <laughs> Not Billy, I know. <laughs> Don't email me. <laughs> okay. Then there's a couple that have connections with our, uh, with our, web, with our podcast. Yeah. Gunship First Strike, you may have recognized from several advertised uh from several shout outs that we did mm-hmm. uh they made 997 percent of what they needed to, to launch their game yeah i'm and, a factor uh, on that one nice oh, yeah, see there you go yeah uh, the cover looked awesome and yeah, then building an elder god the cthulhu card game yeah. another listener they made 168 percent and something that i think needed to be made <laughs> and if i had seen it i would have been a backer Farmageddon, <laughs> the frenetic farming game. Plant and harvest crops for fun and profit. Or, failing that, steal and blow up your neighbor's crops instead. Yeah. So, 
Uh, and they succeeded too with 500% of what they were looking for, which is 25,000. So clearly they, they didn't need a lot or th- didn't think they needed a lot. But with 25,000, they've got a really solid start. Now, this isn't so, just, I, I just want to bring it, you, these mentioned mostly here are related to board games, but video games are doing really well with this too lately. Actually, video yeah. games are doing bigger, and, and I had to dig down to get the, bo- the, the board. Um, games. One of the ones, I just we just got an email today from our friend Randall Bills, who was a third chair host over at uh, Catalyst Game Labs. They just announced. Uh, in cooperation with someone else, a Kickstarter program, they're bringing back the Shadow Run video game, oh, uh, okay. and they're going to publish it on tablets and uh, PCs and everything. And this thing just launched. I think it was today. Their goal is four hundred thousand dollars for all the development costs of the game and everything. They're already at two hundred fifty-eight thousand dollars. Wow! So it's doing great. So I really think it is really amazing if you have, and that's because they have a rep, right? You, everybody knows who Catalyst is. Everybody knows who Shadow Run is. Of course, you want to see that stuff come back. And I think really the key is. To get some of these really big success stories, you have to have a proven success prior to that. And that avoids sort of the biggest, I think, warning that Stephen was talking about when he was on the show, which is, you know, how do you know they're going to come through for you? And so it really comes back to, do you know who's running this program in some way? Do you know them from their prior work or whatever? If you have that, I think you have a really good chance to have a really good relationship with with the program. Yeah. yeah. Although, you know, what's interesting is that, uh, I mean, you just talked about uh, someone set their goal as $400,000 and mm-hmm. you know, other people who set their goal as $10,000. Right. And what's interesting is, um, I think a, a, a study was just published uh, on, on Board Game Geek uh, by A.J. Quinn, who actually went through and tracked everything. And he, he actually found out that, uh, you know, as you'd expect, um, the games that, um, that actually, you know, have higher thresholds, Duh, are making more money by and large, but what's really interesting is that regardless of of what your what your threshold is, it does not seem to to matter. Um, people fund them equally. It's not like the cheaper things are more attainable and just you get a lot more people. The things with huge budgets are actually getting just as 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 many backers involved or more, huh. um, so that. It's 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 actually interesting. You know, you'd think, oh well, oh, God, four hundred thousand dollars. Who's? Who, I'll, I'll never reach my number. But the the numbers don't prove that out. The people are getting those numbers. That's really wow. interesting. Yeah, and quite honestly, it's almost hard to do a project with a small budget. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, um, you know, let's let's say you know you don't have uh, the power of a big property behind you. Um, if you're like a, a brand new company. Um, with you know relative unknown, you're gonna have to do a lot of advertising, and the advertising, you know, it's it's like international shipping. It's you know it's it's a it's a sunk cost that you have to pay and pay for out of out of you know whatever funds you're able to garner. Uh, it actually makes more sense for you to 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 go and have a, a bigger threshold and try to get a bigger nut to help pay for all the all the advertising you need to make sure people are coming to the site and pledging. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, it, that's really interesting. That's actually a really interesting observation. Yeah. So oh, I was just looking at this. So <laughs> I was looking at the Shadow Run one still. There's a they have a pledge level of ten thousand dollars. Okay, and they've already gotten they, they've got a limit of three of these, and they've already gotten two backers of the three. I paid ten. <laughs> what for what this. do you get for ten thousand? Okay, all the previous rewards plus Mike Vol- Mike Mulville, I think is his name is, who's the original Shadow Run game development guy from FASA. Okay. Yeah. He will come to your town and run a tabletop game of Shadow Run for you and five of your closest friends. Wow. <laughs> only 10K. And there's only one left. So, you know, get in the way you can. Wow. <laughs> but that's that's the kind of stuff you can do, right? And it's like if you're if you're an Uber fan of Shadow Run, you know, yeah. you got the money. Hey. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Why not? That's pretty cool. <laughs> and and people people are paying to to have that kind of an involvement with right. the game. And because I mean when when you think about creative projects, creative projects not only do the do the creators themselves have passion for what they do, but the fan base, whether it is for, you know, short documentary films or theater or board games, people themselves have a lot of passion about these things. So that's, you know, that's what really drives the involvement to be part of that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think that's a huge thing. It's, it just, you cannot underestimate the strength of the desire for people to be an mm-hmm. insider. And that's where it really comes back to gamers because we, um, as gamers, we love to get our input in on new designs. We love, you know, when we get passionate about our hobby, we love to be involved with that. I think it's one of the reasons that we're seeing so many great successes in Kickstarter 
with gaming related to gaming because there is that desire to, I want to be part of it. I want my name to be stamped on this thing too. And, and Kickstarter basically says, yeah, sure. Come on in. You can, you can do it if you're willing to, you know, help yeah. us make this happen. Right. Uh, it's, it's very, very, very community minded. So what are some of the, I mean, we're talking a lot about a lot of stuff going on here. What are some of the reasons that you might want to use Kickstarter in addition to the obvious sort of thing of, of getting capital? Well, I mean, so if, if you're, if you're a project owner, um, just from, from personal experience, I, I can tell you when, when I actually decided, uh, okay, you know what, I've got a game that I really love. Maybe I'll open a game company. Um, I had to put a second mortgage on my house to fund that game. Okay. And that's without having distribution, without knowing how it was going to you know, work out in the marketplace. And that was a significant risk for me and my family to take yeah, on. Very scary. Yeah. 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 So, um, so really the biggest pro is that it, it greatly reduces that risk by giving you some upfront capital that you can work with. Um, so you don't have to put your house at risk. Um, but on top of that, the other thing is that what this really is, it, it's a, it's a way of doing pre-sales for your product. Oh, so cool. even yeah, before yeah, sure. you have to, you have to like find a distributor and, you know, this kind of thing. that. You've got you've got a dedicated fan base that not only are buying that first copy, but then telling their friends, and they're starting to go to stores and saying, "Oh, can I get?" The, you know, so the 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 buzz and the momentum is building, yeah. And that kind of PR for especially for a new or unknown company mm-hmm. is huge in getting yeah. recognized and eventually getting distributors. So mm-hmm. so those are all extremely good reasons why you know as a as a project owner. You'd want to get involved with with Kickstarter. I think the other the other thing too, it's, I guess it goes without saying, but maybe it should be said, <laughs> is that um, uh, not only do you get the capital without having to put your own up, you know, and you're going to get your pre sale numbers right and kind of gauge interest. You're also going to know if it's a bad idea, right? Because basically, if you think you have the best, you know, God's gift to gaming, and you throw it out there on Kickstarter, and there's just crickets. Yeah, uh, well, that's a good point. You saved yourself a bunch of time and effort, and go Although try something you else. Gotta you gotta know? say you you can't just take that as a no. You know, you got to keep your dream alive. Sure, but it's probably a good a good gauge. <laughs> yeah. Although what I will say, and what I think can be a you know one slight con is that um, if uh, just by looking at the 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 video. And just by looking at the the components that they're talking about, mm-hmm. the theme could be great. The storytelling of how they're bringing it to life could be great. What you don't really know and what you really can't tell by watching the, the video is how it really plays. Mm-hmm. So I think there have been probably a couple of games that, you know, sounded, you know, really tight and great and even had some beautiful art. But when you actually got the, the game and put it on the table... It didn't quite deliver all that you'd hope. So the, what you don't get is the ability for a game to be published and reviewers and other fans start talking about it from their play experiences. Right. Because, you know, I, when, when, I, when I shop for a game, it's usually because I started to hear some really great buzz on people who've played it. Right. Yeah. And that's what you don't get. So it is a little bit of a buyer beware because you don't know exactly how the game plays. Uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, and we've already talked a lot about the pros from the buyer's perspective with the involvement in the industry that you love and access to all the the newest hotness, like you just said, and uh, the special perks. But what about cons for either of them? Like you just you just said one. What are some other negatives that we can think of that maybe this is like you know some 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 more caveat for the M tour? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, the only thing I th- I, th- I think potentially the biggest thing is that. You know, when I, when I put a second mortgage on my house, uh-huh. I had to be damn sure that the game was going to be something that I really thought was going to sell and keep selling. Right. You know, so as as the creator, there's a lot of pressure to deliver quality in that box and not just the, the look and tone of it, but, you know, a playable, cool game that people are going to love. Right. If you take that pressure off, you probably are going to start seeing some games that, you know, maybe didn't have quite the right juice that they need to, uh-huh. to be successful in the marketplace. Um, so I, I think that's, that's one of the things. And the other, I suppose, is that, you know, it, it could lead to a little bit of an oversaturation of new games in the market, particularly if some of those games are not delivering all that you'd hope from. Right. Um, right. It can help curb people's appetite for gaming because they hit one too many clunkers. Right. Yeah. Um, but 
I don't know that those are like huge cons. I, I think that um, these are still people's babies and they still have a lot of passion, you know, right, for yeah, them. Yeah. I, but I think that, you know, there's probably a small, a small thought there. The only, the only other thing is I think retailers don't necessarily love it just because um, initial sales are so key for distributors and retailers. Right. Um, right. And, and those initial in. sales, I think I, I heard even at uh, the Gamma Trade Show uh, this year, you know, they, get, they feel like they're going to get curbed by the fact that all those gamers have already, like, gotten their copy from participating. Uh huh. Well, I also know that uh, the other the other con I've seen, and uh, I think this happened happened a little bit to Eminent Domain or, or somebody, is that you know these the game the the producers will get their games out of Kickstarter and they'll get them shipped just in time for like Gen Con or something, yeah. and they'll have them at the con ready to sell, but they haven't had a chance to distribute them to all the Kickstarter people, and right. now they've got this sort of awkward situation where they want to sell them, but shouldn't the Kickstarter guys get them first? You know, so you, you got to yeah. really kind of manage that whole thing and the expectations carefully, right? Or you can get into some trouble yeah. there. Well, I think yeah. I, I think that's probably one of the hardest things for somebody. I mean, you're you you know you're you're do, you're doing game designing maybe for the first time, so you've got a whole slew of skills that you're trying to use for the first time and develop. And on top of that, you've got all of these little perks and um and rewards that you've thought up. Yeah. But like one problem that I saw one company had was. Their lowest level of um, of investment, they offered a poster, and they did not, in any of their calculations, uh, figure out how much it would cost to make and ship those posters. And it sucked up a huge amount of the money that they made <laughs> yeah. to the point where it almost it almost made it useless what they were doing. So you you really have to go in there because. There, nobody's going to do that kind of homework for you. You have to know what's going on, or you're going to set yourself up for failure. You really, you are on your own. You're working without a net, so you have to go in there, you know, with 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 your brain working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, absolutely. So, Kurt, you as a as a successful small game design publishing house doohickey there, yep. uh, studio, if you will. I would say powerhouse. Powerhouse, right? Oh, oh uh, so kind. <laughs> a, a really awesome, fantastic games, really. Um, are, are you guys looking at Kickstarter? Are, is this something that's attractive to you? Well, uh, I think the answer is probably yes, but I'm 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 kind of cautious about it, and the the reason is, um, although you you've got you've kind of pointed out some things I didn't necessarily think about. In fact, you know, things about the, the kind of known quantity helping to make my investment more attractive. Yeah, um, I hadn't really been thinking about it like that. I, I really saw Kickstarter more for. Uh, for people who you know were trying, you know, who didn't have easy access to any capital, and so you know, my involvement is, is as a backer is to really help them to to do something they couldn't normally do themselves, and I, mm-hmm. I know how hard that is. So you know, I I looked at projects that um, that I thought were really interesting from relative unknowns, um, and wanted to wanted to help help them along. And I backed maybe five or six projects, mm-hmm. um, and I kind of. I think I fear a little bit of a backlash against established companies using it. You know, if um, if all of a sudden you know Fantasy Flight Games is on there, yeah. you're like, "Come on, really? What, what? Why do you need crowdfunding for any of your games?" Right. <laughs> um, but um, I'm still, you know, as as fabulous as uh, as my games are, I, I am still relatively a, a small player, um, and so so maybe. Um, Maybe it really just kind of minimizes, uh, you know, any any fears about my ability to come through with something of, of quality. Um, but I think my answer in general is that um, uh, if and when I, I go ahead and use Kickstarter, it's probably going to be for special projects. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so I, I can I can go ahead and, and fund uh, you know certain of my games with without much of a trouble at this point i've been in i've been doing it nine years so right you know when i when i release a game i can usually have it paid back in a decent amount of time yeah but there are some games that i would love to make that mm-hmm. i might not even really put into regular distribution um partly because not all the games that i come up with necessarily fit nicely underneath my smirk and dagger banner right doesn't mean that I don't have passion for the games and I wouldn't want to, you know, have them made. But as I learned with uh, my uh, Sutaku Dice game, 
um, people really wanted that smirkiness to come from me. And when it doesn't, they're like, what are you, what are you doing? This, this isn't you. What is this? <laughs> Which I liked. I liked the game, by the way, but it was definitely a different feel for, for your company than your other games. No question. And, and particularly people who tried it without the, uh, the game cards that we added uh, mm-hmm. later. Uh, but, and I think the game cards actually helped prove my my whole uh, mission statement, which is that games are more fun when you can stab a friend in the back. Exactly. Even that small addition <laughs> made it. Yeah. Well, I think you mentioned the idea that, you know, um, do established companies, should they use Kickstarter? I, I can think of a couple, you know, you're starting to see it in the video game industry. For example, um, uh, Tim Schafer, uh, a very well-known video game designer at Double Fine Studios, uh, he makes uh, very wacky video games that many are very, very well critically acclaimed, but they're not exactly blockbuster successes. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, he did a lot of the old uh, Day of the Tentacle stuff for LucasArts, and then he, later he did... Um, you know, um, Psychonauts and all these other great games that are sort of like cult classics. He recently did a Kickstarter thing, and like within eight hours, he broke over four hundred thousand dollars because people there's enough fans of his game, but he couldn't get studios to publish them, right? Because the studio right. yep. wouldn't yeah. do it; it's not big enough. So I, I would kind of think it's a great way for an established company of like yourself. Let's say you've got a quirky idea that maybe Smirk and Dagger, but you're not sure there's enough interest in it. It kind of would seem like a great way to say, you know, here is that next. Or there's one more expansion someone wants for this core game that you're not really sure many people would buy, but you, well, we'll put it on Kickstarter to see if we get interest. Yeah, we'll do it, you know, kind of thing. It seems like the kind of way you could sort of say to your fans, yeah, if you really want this, we'll make it happen, but we need to get X amount of dollars to make this work. Does, does that make right. sense at all? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, and one of, the, one of the games I'm, I'm actually thinking about uh, putting on is um, uh, a game called uh, Kabukazi. And mm. uh, it is... It's a 12th century Japanese card game. <laughs> um, uh, it's actually the, the, the game That's that cool. uh, the Yakuza, the, the uh, Japanese mafia, got their name from. Oh, wow. Uh, y- Yakuza is actually uh, 893, I believe, <laughs> um, in, in the ancient you know, Japanese language. And it's, it's actually the losing hand. Oh, wow. Um, That's funny. Yeah, because uh, apparently when... Um, when you when you uh, when you get that hand, it's a, it's a worthless hand, and they kind of felt like society viewed them as a bit worthless or kind of you know, just the that would, which is going to be ostracized, and so they took it as their name. But it was a gambling oh, wow. game that they all played. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so anyway, it's it's, it's actually a, a pretty zen like uh, wagering game, and um, it's something that I you know I don't know that I would actually put on press into broad distribution. But it's a really cool game with a great history that I would love to share with people. And so that might be a reason why Kickstarter would make sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. Um, and then the other thing that we are thinking about doing is, um, and uh, a dramatic drum roll, please. Oh, I'll have to do. <laughs> that, was pretty, wow. that was pretty anemic. <laughs> it was. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. Um, we are... Uh, we are going to be launching a Cutthroat Caverns app. Ooh, sweet! Ah, yes, nice. and may I say it's about time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, so it's currently in development, um, but what has uh, what has uh, come very quickly to um, to our realization is that uh, we simply don't have enough capital to uh, to make this all that we want it to be right out of the gate. Yeah, software development is not cheap. It is not cheap. No. Um, so clearly you need a really good AI so you can play mm-hmm. it solo. Right. And because it's such a gotchu game, you know, you kind of want it with like the multiplayer network function. Oh, yeah. Um, but in order to get the networked functionality, it looks like uh, crowdfunding could indeed uh, come into play. Well, there you go. Play. Kickstarter could save the day here. Yes. Save uh, Cutthroat Caverns the app. That'd be awesome. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Nice. And that might make might actually get me to get a smartphone. Oh, dude, I'd back that app in a heartbeat, dude. I'll tell you right now. <laughs> Just say the word. I'm on that one. I'm day one. Day uh, one. Well, thank you. <laughs> Especially if it comes with, you know, the lowest level needs to be one of those little white smirk and dagger buttons. You know, pledge a dollar, get a button or <laughs> whatever it is. <laughs> I love those little buttons. I always sneak by your booth and steal like three when you're not looking, by the way, at the cons. Just saying. No, that's all right. That's why they're there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um. But yeah, it's it's actually coming. It's coming along. Um, I, I'm pretty excited about it. Um, I'm actually about to launch a um, a little bit of a poll um, to try to get uh, just some early reads on what people really think are important as uh, functionality. 
Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be um, putting a, a, a poll up uh, pretty soon to just try to see, you know, what of all the things that could be in there, you know, campaign mode or achievement yeah. levels or, you know, uh, a, a, a shorter game, you know, for, uh, you know, it's like, you know, it's going to be instead of nine encounters, four encounters and you're at 50 life points just so it, it speeds it along a little. I, I'm I, just going like, to kind of like generally let, let people tell me what they what they want. Out. I, have, I have one. Can I put yeah. one in? So I, I vote for asynchronous gameplay. Right? Very, very hard with this game. I'll tell you I why. know. Well, yeah, it is, it is hard because people got to jump in and block you, right? That's the problem. Yeah. That, so asynchronous is probably not going to happen. I know. Stop, but that, that's, <laughs> that's what makes them awesome. Bum, bum, can, I know. I yeah. Know, I know. All right. Well, I can dream. I have an idea. What I think I really would like <laughs> to see is a three-dimensional hologram version, <laughs> Kirk. If you could put that together. Just saying. That, drawn, that would be awesome. I'm just saying that, you know, draw something just sold for $200 million and they have asynchronous. I'm just, just throwing that out there. Uh-huh. It would be How tricky, does though. How really do that? Well, if, you I, if I play a card and then everybody else responds, yeah, it would, take, uh, it would be hard. Could, it would be you hard. You couldn't do it. I don't know. Anyway, that, that sounds awesome, Kurt. That, that sounds fantastic. With yeah. asynchronous or without, I'm backing you. I'm right there, baby. Cool. I got you back. <laughs> awesome. So anything else you want to say about Kickstarter here? Um, in general, I think Kickstarter is a, a really ingenious uh, platform for, for people to come together and support what they love. And whether that means you're a, a, a backer, you know, wanting to be part of, of getting something made, whether you're um, someone who's got a dream and just wants to see it realized, I think that Kickstarter is a wonderful opportunity for, for all, those, all those reasons. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, 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 I was very skeptical until I started looking into it for this segment. And I, you, you cannot go on that website without starting to bounce from cool looking thing to cool looking thing, <laughs> right. and start going. Oh, maybe. Oh, the, oh, only a buck there. Oh, only five bucks there. Oh, I mean, I think it's a very, very neat idea that whose time has probably come. You just got to know what you're getting into. You got to, you, as right. as both us as a project uh, creator and as a as a backer, you just have to kind of do your research and understand it, and don't take for granted everything you see, but at the same time, if everything involves a known quantity, uh, just like eBay, you can get some really good results, right? So yep. I think it's, it's a, you get out of it what you put into it, both, both directions. Yeah. I think, Great. It's, I, I think it's very cool. So head on over to Kickstarter and check out all the crazy projects. That's right. And, and keep an eye out for that uh, app from uh, Smirk That's and right. Dagger. <laughs> Smirk and Dagger. Indeed. Foes to vanquish, violence to sow, and medieval crops to reap. The whole world of gaming at your fingertips. The D6 generation. Born to game. That is the sound. Oh, that's gotta mean that. That is the sound of a Viking coming towards us. A rabid Viking, Vic the Viking. Vic, Vic the rabid Viking <laughs> coming big, to you. Big foamy orange beard. Absolutely, bringing the war to your door since 1999. That's a decade or more. You know, with the what? Well, go ahead. Wanting- they have the best prices on the net. But what I like about the War Store is their great service and they're a fantastic miniature selection. So here I am. You know, I'm thinking, gee. I am getting into this Dust Warfare game. See, I'm talking about it constantly yeah. this episode. Again. Constantly. You cannot escape it. I'm so good at this game. And I'm like, you know, where can I go to get a pictures of all the stuff they've ever released? I'm on the Fantasy Flight website, but some of the stuff, the pictures are really small. I can't see what's exactly in the box. I'm like, I don't know, the War Store, this is like a board game halfway. And I don't got to care. Sure enough, they got everything, including all the preview pics of all the new Soviet stuff coming out. I'm like, you guys are awesome. So I'm looking through all the pictures, getting everything, figuring out what I need to get. I love the War Store. They just have, if it's a miniature game, they have it, and they have it all broken out, ready to go. You can even pre-order stuff there if it's not out yet. It's just awesome. And quite often, what you're looking at is actually the write-up from the company's own website. Right. So rather than jump around to a bunch of different companies' websites, you go to the War Store, you can compare stuff, you can bring up a couple different windows, and you're reading the little the little uh, 
the little blurbs right off the websites in most mm-hmm. cases. So it is, it is, and I will admit that I've looked at one or two boxes of dust tactics to myself. And, it's only a uh, matter of time. You too will succumb to the yeah, pressure. You are the biggest Jedi jerk on the planet. <laughs> That's all I got to say. It's just awesome. It's awesome. It, it, yeah, whatever. But you know what I'm not Jedi mind tricking about? The War Store. It is fantastic. No, no, you will not there is no Jedi mind trick required for the War Store because awesome information, awesome selection, awesome service, all in one place. And that one place is, Russ? TheWarStore.com. And follow them on Twitter, at TheWarStore, for all the new news. <laughs> Welcome to another edition of the Hollywood Minute. This Hollywood Minute is brought to you by Royal River Rampage. 2.4K Warhammer Fantasy Battles at Blood in the Sun Primer. April 5th and 6th at Dirigo Hobbies in Yarmouth, Maine. Where do you go? Look at at Dirigo Hobbies, which is next to at Bruce's Burritos. Yum, burritos. I just had Mexican food tonight. I actually had some chicken fajitas con pico de gallo. It's my favorite way to have it with no chilies y no cebollas. That's my favorite way to go uh, to go Mexican. Uh, let's see what's going on in my neck of the woods. I guess I'm just really, 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 really enjoying Flames of War 3.0. We've got a great crew of guys playing. We're playing very loyally, very religiously. We've got Stino playing the Germans. We've got Andy playing the Russians. We've got Matt playing U.S. paratroopers. And we've got me playing a mix of, uh, uh, U.S. doughboys and or assault boat companies. And um, really reading the rules this time, getting a little rules crunchy. Uh, I want to kind of. I, I always, I always like this when a new edition comes out because I get a chance to kind of uh, start fresh and feel like I'm learning the l- rules right along with everybody else. And um, right now, uh, our game group's having an interesting discussion over how to handle area terrain, and it kind of reminds me back of my DAC days in a good way about how we would discuss. Um, you know, different rules, interpretations, and this one has to do with one set of rules that says if you're completely within area terrain, uh, you cannot be seen except outside six inches. Another interpretation is if you're completely within area terrain, but the terrain is not taller than both the target team and the shooting team, um, then you can see in farther than six inches. So in other words, if you've got infantry squatting inside a wheat field, and you have infantry outside, everybody seems to agree the wheat's taller than both, and you can't see in. But if you have a tank outside of six inches, uh, some people say, um, nope, infantry is completely concealed within, and other people say no because the wheat has to be taller than the tank. So it's interesting. Um, There's definitely the way the rules are written. They kind of do the situation where one rule on one page is clear and day, but then they kind of mix some terminology in a later page. And again, it just reminds me back in the back of days when we'd have these discussions. And ultimately, you know what it all boils down to is um, no matter how right you are, it doesn't matter. It just matters like what you can do and what fun you can have with your game group and uh, what alternatives you can come up with that makes everybody happy. Um, so having a good time there. I'm going to work on a super-duper secret Craig-esque type of project and, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to build a German army. And that's even with Blood, Gluts, and Glory coming out for Flames of War, which is uh, the new tank. I'm going to follow Patton's third army, U.S. Armored Army, and uh, get to drive around with all these tanks. But that being said, I, I want to I wanna build that German train that comes out of Grey Wolf and Red Bear books and uh, build a little short German army, mainly because Stino's our only German player right now. We, and we've got a hardcore four people, so if one of us switches to Germans... We'll always have uh, an Axis and an Allies to play. And it's to the point where I really don't know the German army that well. And when I face my opponent, I really don't know what they can do. And nothing like playing your opponent's army to really get a sense of what they can and can't do. Having a great time with that. Along with my Flames of War kick, I've been listening to a lot of the guys over there at What Would Patton Do podcast. Um, 
you know, I think you guys should listen to it anyway, but if you kind of want to get into Flames of War, really goobing about Flames of War like I am, man, I am eating their podcast up like candy. I even subscribe to their bonus episodes, their after hours, because I can't get enough of what those guys are talking about. They just did a set where they go through rule by rule by rule of version 3, and I really enjoyed that a lot. Almost to the point of, um, I wish I was going to Adepticon this year just to play Flames of War. Um, kind of regret not going at this point, but uh, I think what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to look at some dates and try to go down a horse historic con this year, and this time bring my son. Not so much to be able to play in games, but more to just have a, a, a nice father-son trip and go down and see Civil War and see all the beautiful painted armies, so... I think that's what I'm going to do there. Still enjoying Mouse Guard. Uh, loved the interview, the opportunity with David Peterson. Really looking forward to catching up with him, either at Boston Comic Con, which by the time you hear this might have passed, or up at the uh, other comic convention up there. Speaking of comics, really enjoying a couple comic reads. Really enjoying The Cape still. Really enjoying Jennifer Blood. Really enjoying Incorruptible. Um uh, no, Irredeemable, sorry, I get the two confused. Uh, that was recommended to me by a uh, by a listener, and I uh, really love it. It's an alternative universe, and a guy's kind of got Superman-esque type of powers, but after being a do-gooder for so long, he literally just goes insane, and he just starts uh, mass-murdering everybody. Really enjoying playing Latro still. Um, no level cap yet. Uh, what I'm doing right now is I am running around the areas of a region, and uh, you guys will crack up over this. I'm mining ore because i got to get my prospecting skills up, and the reason why I have to get my prospecting skills up is because there's these special sigils that drop that I need to give to a buddy of mine so he can make jewelry and armor. Um, these sigils are hard to come by. So right now, as you know, my cook is at its highest tier, so now I'm running around farming... Um, or in order to make ingots so that I can get my prospecting levels up. And here's what's funny. I don't buy them on the auction house. I don't know. Old school, man. I got to earn it. Uh, so it's fun, man. I just crank some tunes and I kind of mind meld out. Um, yeah, I think that's all I got for you guys right now. So enjoying a little uh, little Flames of War. I'm painting and modeling up a mad storm. Oh, yeah, I went crazy with terrain, too. Bought all sorts of new 15 mil millimeter JR miniature buildings. Bought some new dirt roads. Um, uh, bought some trees. We're going to have a terrain day. So just having a blast, man. If, you have, if you've always wanted to play a historical war game, I highly recommend you check out Battlefront Miniatures, Flames of Wars. Great places to jump in at any time. Come on in, man. The water's warm. <laughs> And now we're always excited to talk about uh, our sponsor, War Games, Soldiers, and Strategy Magazine. These guys are available everywhere. Finer magazines are sold yep. uh, and shipping to your home. And Craig, what is in the latest issue? Well, the latest issue, that would be 60, is the theme is Airborne Operations in World War II. So that is an extremely popular theme. Ooh, nice. Uh, you're talking about men descending from the clouds, airborne warfare. In the, in the 1470s, an unknown Italian designer first postulated idea, the idea of a parachute as a method of descending safely from altitude. Shortly after this, Leonardo da Vinci expanded on the idea and presented his own variation. So you get like really cool history of yeah. uh, of, air, of, of uh, airborne warfare, the famous Easy Company assault. Very cool. Nice. Okay, so you've that since the HBO series, and it talks about the real actual um, event. Uh, Project Platoon. Come time to try the now uh, they're uh, platoon level. Get looking at several different platoon mm -hmm. level games. So really, just a whole bunch of stuff. Really, about one third of the magazine is uh, those airborne battles from World War II. Yeah, and again, the, our, my favorite thing about this magazine, it looks so beautiful. It definitely looks like a professional magazine, as good as any other pro magazine you'll ever see. Um, the layout's fantastic. The, the way they do the shots of the miniatures are awesome. And if you're any kind of modeler, this magazine's for you, even if you're not a historical gamer, because there's so much great modeling and just photos and just amazing things to look Absolutely. at. But if you are a, a, a historical gamer, then this is also huge because it, it might as well be a catalog of all the latest models that have come out. Yeah. They review them all. They've got to scale pictures of all mm -hmm. the almost all the minis mm -hmm. that have come out. They look at them all. I mean, it's really it's an amazing um, uh, reference for uh, for for war for historical war gamers in particular. But as you say, Russ, war gamers in general. Yeah. So check out uh, 
their website over at uh, www.wssmagazine.com. And what's the code you want to put in, Craig, to get extra little bonus off? Uh, the code, I would imagine, would be something along the lines of um, uh, D6G. Right. Say 15% on your subscriptions or orders. 15% on anything in their web shop. Woohoo! This is Total Fangirl. Regular Jane most days, Total Fangirl when the moment strikes. Han shot first. Starbuck is a guy. And Lestat now there's a vampire. Hey everyone, this is Nicole, your Total Fangirl. You can follow me on Twitter at Nicole Wakeland. Check out my blog, TotalFangirl.com. This week's shout out, join Cranky and the guys from Garage Hammer, Ohio Hammer, and Wisco Dice by joining Team Cranky for Extra Life this year. Extra-life.org. So me and Russ and all the other gamers and geeks in New England have just come back from one of my favorite conventions. PAX East was held in Boston on Easter weekend. Yeah, just about the worst possible weekend for a convention. I think it was the first time, uh, I know definitely for PAX East, I don't know how PAX Prime goes, but they actually didn't sell out on Sunday. You could have purchased a ticket on Sunday. And from what I hear from the people who did go, that was the day to go because, man, was it quiet. Uh, The worst part for me was not having to be up crazy late on Friday and Saturday, and they managed to cook for 12 people on Sunday. It was more that my kids couldn't go this year because, well... Easter, Easter Bunny, that takes priority. So the girls didn't get to go, and they were very, very sad. Uh, I think they were sadder than probably some grown-up gamers that couldn't attend because they had family responsibilities. But what that meant was all of us pretty much packed three days' worth of convention goodness into two days. Uh, It was quite busy on Friday and Saturday. It was mobbed. Uh, There was a lot to see. As usual, there were some fantastic costumes. My favorite costumes, though, there was a group of guys, I'm going to say six of them, that were doing Warhammer 40K. Uh, They had one who was dressed up um, from like every, there was an orc that was like in this cardboard thing that looked vaguely like something that my kids uh, might have done, uh, and they were they were just really fantastic. I also saw, uh, although I did not take pictures, so you will not find this anywhere. A guy dressed like Sailor Moon, so you know, something for everyone. Uh, but aside from the costumes and the fun and getting to see a lot of people that come into town just for this from halfway across the country, uh, there were a lot of really cool games. One of my favorite things that I managed to get my hand on, uh, there's a Munchkin the Guild uh, game that's come out. It's like a booster. It's not really an expansion. It's its, its own little game. And it debuted at PAX East. And you kind of had to fight your way over to the table by Steve Jackson Games, I think, where they had it. And it was fantastic. I was so happy to get myself some. I even shipped some off to some lucky friends halfway across the country because they saw on Twitter that it was available and they asked me to get it for them. So there were a few little new releases. Uh, There was a funky thing called Scallops. There was actually a Kickstarter uh, that lets you sort of an ultimate card stacking game. Instead of having to stack cards to make, you know, a house of cards, they look like little hat, little scallops, and you can they have little slots in them, and you can make these crazy creations out of cards. And those guys were kind of the thing that most impressed me, not them specifically, but the number of Kickstarter projects that were either almost ready just debuting uh, or had had done phenomenally well and were in the process of selling to people for the first time because they had just filled the orders for their game or their product from people who had donated to make the Kickstarter happen. And now they finally had enough to say, okay, general public, this is what all the Kickstarter folks managed to get to you. Uh, one of them, Scallops, was actually, what was neat about that was they hadn't filled all their orders for the people who had participated in the Kickstarter. So they were only taking orders from people at the con because they said, even though we could sell it to you right now, it wouldn't be fair to the folks that we haven't shipped to yet. They helped uh, donate and, and give us the money to get us going, so we're going to make sure they get it first, which I thought was pretty neat because you probably could have made a few extra bucks if you'd actually had them to sell on hand. But it was really amazing to see the number of projects out there that were based on a Kickstarter. And not that they were still trying or trying to get you to fund them, but actually had made it. Um, there was another one that was laser cut scenery that had fantastic teeny tiny little detailed etching with symbols and crosses and you know fiery brands and all these things that was they could paint up that looked beautiful for terrain. 
and I guess it, what was neat for me is, you know, you think about game conventions and there's huge, huge booths from great, big, huge companies who have lots of money to buy pretty things for booths. They have 30 screens for their games or they have huge tables that, you know, look like something you'd find in like a, a professional uh, poker tournament in Las Vegas that are covered with, you know, the velvety stuff and, and look really snazzy and every employee wears a matching shirt and, you know, it, it, handing out buttons and pins and, and shirts and posters and all sorts of cool stuff. And that's always a lot of fun to see. And there's always neat stuff in terms of swag and just neat stuff to get your hands on. But there were a lot of games that were small. And that's what I like about PAX is the number of smaller companies, smaller games, sort of like indie startup-y type people who are out there trying to make things happen. Uh, Russ might be talking about some of these, but the ones that stuck with me, the Scallops, uh, the little terrain company who I've drawing a total blank on, but I've got pictures of this all on my blog. If you check out um, Total Fangirl, there's a post about everything that went on in PAX, and I've got pictures of it. And there's a little... Um, MMO type game that's all space battle. It's called Novus Eterno. Uh, there were also a lot of MMOs there. I think the biggest challenge there would be, you know, we all only have so many dollars in our pockets and time in our day, and I have no idea how to pick which ones I'm going to play next. So once again, PAX East, despite being only two days, huge success, heck of a lot of fun. Next year, I'm just really hoping I don't have to deal with Easter at the end. Hey, and as we've been mentioning over the course of this uh, episode, of course, Ross and I are very much looking forward to Adepticon next Indeed. weekend. Indeed. And uh, what, what, well, what, if not who, what as in an, a venerable institution, who as in lots of people from all <laughs> around the world, are we going to be meeting there, Russ? Of course, the folks at Geek Nation Tours and all the lucky folks on that tour. That's right. All those folks from all over the world who are traveling with Geek Nation tours. And unfortunately, for those of you hearing our voices right now, booking is finished for Adepticon this year. Indeed, because it's only a couple weeks away. Is it even two <laughs> weeks it's, away? It's but, liter- literally less than five days away when you hear yeah, our By the time you hear now. this, we may already be there. We will already be there, but Russ isn't really good with calendars. But no, no, I'm not. if you're really interested in a trip... And, uh, and, and you want to know something that you know for a fact you can get in on, that would be Geeking Out with Miniatures in England 2012. Mm-hmm, That's September 18th through the 28th, and you go all over the place seeing all kinds of cool stuff. Um, so you might want to think about that because uh, that's cool. <laughs> Thanks for the details on that, because it does sound yeah. cool. Well, I just, I, I cool just suddenly stuff in stopped, because cool. I'm, I'm looking through the website, and I'm seeing pictures of people playing games on a bus. So that's all that? you need to know. You play games <laughs> the whole trip, including on the coach. And that is a very nice, classy Euro touring coach, by the way. I've always wanted so, to go to Warhammer World. Did they stop at Warhammer World? Uh, I'm I'm seeing uh, Maelstrom games. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing Bad Dice podcast, yeah. Overlords, 40k UK podcast, Warlord games, and Mantic games. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm I don't know. Oh uh, yeah, Warhammer, Warhammer World, World right do. there on day nine. And it's in Nottingham, so you're also next to Robin Hood. That's which is very all true. Yeah, and you know he's still there. You know he's hanging out. He never okay. dies. He's timeless. All he's a hero. Tour members will have the opportunity to play two or more friendly 40k or fantasy games. Wow. Nice. Look at yeah, uh-huh. see, that's just fantastic. You get, to, you get to go to the miniatures. Hall. Wow, oh man, I roast know. beef dinner. At, oh, do you think if we get in a, in a suitcase and just put Husbands ourselves on the bus, are... they'll take us with us? No, oh, that'd be man. awesome. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, the, I would highly recommend you check that out because those are going fast. This trip almost always sells out, and the uh, and the the. Um, the trip, the tour has been up for several weeks now. So go to the website geeknationtours.com. Click on upcoming tours and check out the Geeking Out with Miniatures in England Tour 2012 because A, it's awesome, and B, it's going fast. Are you looking for news, reviews, and interviews? The D6 Generation. It's groovy is, it's groovy does defy, baby. The D6 Generation. Born to gain. Oh, yeah. 
I'm Dan, your friendly professional game guide. Welcome back to When You Wish Upon a Game, where we discuss ways we can make the game industry better. I'm in the car on the way back from two weeks of conventions and trade shows. Some of you may have visited the Game Salute booth at PAX East in Boston. We were packed the whole time, so thank you. After that, I'm tra- I traveled out to Madison, Wisconsin for a trade show and spent days talking with lots of awesome stores and publishers. Yes, I'm tired, but I'm also reinvigorated, as I always am after this type of trip, due to the sheer overwhelming potential I've seen expressed in game ideas and concepts from all sorts of folks around the industry. During the two panels I presented at PAX, people were excited about it creating their games, and they recognized that there's a best way to do it. We're no longer floundering around just thinking, oh, I'll toss some cards together, I'll put a book together. We're actually looking at it from the perspective of how do I make this best type of way to share this product with the entire games community, whether it's through selling it or just sharing it or whatever. It's a bit like watching a child grow up. They're constantly surprising you. You're learning new steps, new activities, new words. A lot of them you don't quite understand, but you can see that they're moving towards something that makes sense. There's new excitement and vigor expressed in innovative endeavors, whether it's starting a new game company, starting a new game group in your local community, opening or revitalizing a store, or just designing a new game. As an industry, we have the opportunity to expand, to grow in a steady and healthy fashion. And I appreciate everyone who took the time to come and talk to me during these last two weeks and share their thoughts and ideas about that. I want to hear from you. Email me at wish at gamesalute.com and tell me what your dreams are for the industry. I know that's kind of the gist of this whole thing, but especially these past two weeks, I've been thinking a lot about how we can do things better and how we can make your untapped potential into reality. So drop me a line. Again, that's wish at gamesalute.com. It's good to be home, and I look forward to waking up every day to work with enthusiastic, dedicated people who share this passion of tabletop games. That's what I see when I wish upon a game. How about you? Thanks for listening, and have fun playing. And one of our newest sponsors is, of course, Game Salute. And you know what's amazing about these guys is how they help game companies get their games exposure. Um, I was just at PAX East. Now, PAX East is in a fantastic con, massive location for video games, but also board games are expanding the board games. And guess who had the absolutely oh. largest board game booth there? Who? Right next to the tiny little, tiny little Fantasy Flight Games booth, Game Salute. You're Game kidding. Salute was huge. They had their own booth? They had their own massive booth, dude. It was wow. huge. Plenty of room to teach games, show off all the different games from various publishers. It was fantastic and a great way for smaller publishers to get exposure at a massive con like PAX. Just That's by having the thing their stuff. about Game Salute is that they're working with huge manufacturers and the little guys. Right. They help the little guys band together and get exposure, exposure at a large con like this. They, uh, most, you know, only a company like FFG could get a booth at a place like PAX, and their booth was tiny. Here you have a booth that's like three times the size of FFG's booth, exposing a lot of smaller publishers' games. It's a great way to do it. And if you're a gamer, go on over to Game Salute, check out the store locator, the gamestorelocator.com, and check out where your favorite store is. That also works with Game Salute. And if your store's not on there already, have them go to gamestorelocator.com and sign on up and get involved with Game Salute and carry some of those great smaller titles that um, that might be under the radar of your store owner. Absolutely. You're listening to the D6 Generation. Born to game. Welcome back, and now we're excited to talk about the new hotness. It well, is the new hotness. It's definitely new hotness in our group, and it's pretty hot on Board Game Geek and everywhere else right now. Lords of Waterdeep. Or also known as Lords of Waterdeep. Yes, Lords of Waterdeep was just published by Wizards of the Coast here in 2012. Here, and here in 2012. Well, in case you're listening, the time traveler. In, the, in case you're listening to the show next year for the first time. Uh-huh. Uh, the designers are Peter Lee and Rodney Thompson. Kurt, do you know you these gentlemen? Are familiar with their works? I- no. no. Okay. Well, Peter Lee apparently worked on Heroescape and several of the other D&D board games, including uh, Legend of Drizzt, Wrath, Wrath of a Shardalon, and Ravenloft. Uh-huh. And uh, I guess Rodney Thompson came to fame. He's worked a lot of different companies as a freelance designer, AEG and others, also on the Star Wars RPG and on Dungeons & Dragons itself, the RPGs. So he's got a lot of, a lot of cred there. 
Now, the interesting thing is that this game looks nothing like HeroScape, the D&D board games, no. or a role-playing game of but, any stripe. No, but it does capture what it's trying to do extremely oh, it well. It does a more great than, job. It's interesting that, that they're, uh, they're uh, expanding their skill sets. So, Craig, why don't you get all theatrical on us here and read us the theme as uh, described in the box here. <clears throat> Water deep. The city of splendors. The most resplendent jewel in the forgotten realms and a den of political intrigue and shady back-alley dealings. In this game, the players are powerful lords vying for control of this great city. Its treasures and resources are ripe for the taking, and that which cannot be gained through trickery and negotiation must be taken by force. In Waterdeep, a strategy board game for two to five players, you take on the role of one of the masked lords of Waterdeep, secret rulers of the city. Through your agents, you you recruit adventurers to go on quests on your behalf, earning rewards and increasing your influence over the city. Expand the city by purchasing new buildings that open up new actions on the board and hinder or help the other lords by playing intrigue cards to enact your carefully laid plans. Two to five player work, worker placement, game, game length, <laughs> one to one and a half hours. Thank you, Craig. So, Kurt, hey, you. On, the, on the game length there, one and a half, one to one, what have you found the game length to be for your, your play sessions there? Um, I've actually found that to be, um, I mean, you have to kind of excuse like the first game as you're really kind of learning the mm-hmm. rules, but I, but I think it's about it's about that actual playing time. There you go. All right. Yeah. Well, so the first time you got to open the box, uh, Craig, what does this box sound like when it opens? Keeping in mind, it's kind of a different looking box. <laughs> this box. <laughs> That's what it sounds was like. That, was it a bat? And, and that that last. Was actually like the the lid because that's my one complaint. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that was me throwing the lid across the room because it's going to be in your way no matter what. That's yes, that's what that was. Yeah, the box the box itself is unusual because it's got this sort of weird design where there's like uh, a tray on the bottom and there's like little thin inserts for the walls and then another tray goes on the top. So it's sort of like. It looks cool on the shelf. It but looks the, cool on the shelf, exactly. And then when you're playing, there's no way for you to nest the top into the the bottom into mm-hmm. the top so that it's that it to it doesn't take up any more space. So instead, you've literally got the cover the the, the box cover is just in your way wherever you're playing. I lean it up against the wall. That's the not shelf the worst. Thing. That's not the worst. The worst is as you as you kind of you know described you know, audio with the, the magic of, of radio, it's heft. There's a lot of stuff in the box, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. lots of little bits and pieces. And, you know, I tell you what, th- one, one, one bad, one bad uh, tip of the box, and it's going everywhere. There, there's, there's nothing holding this lid on. That's, well, that's true the, because the bo- the box lid doesn't go all the way down the right. sides like a normal box. The box no, lid only goes down about an inch. I didn't even it's like, think it's like that. A hat box. Yeah, the depth of yeah the depth of the lid is about the depth of a shoebox lid. So if you turn it over or invert it at all, it's going to fall right off. Oh. So um, I use uh, Hugo's amazing tape. Yes. <laughs> uh, or rubber band would work too, but Hugo's amazing tape is perfect for this job because you wrap it around the lid and hold it on real tight. More about that a little later, but yes, it definitely has that one design flaw on the box. Um, but anyway, so but we open the box and ins- what do we find, Russ? Inside this crazy box is lots of stuff. First of all, there's the lovely full color rules booklet, 23 pages long, a great table of contents. There's no index, but I'm totally forgiving them for that because. On the back is a fantastic quick reference that is so well detailed that once you've played the game even halfway through, you only need the back of the book forever. It's that simple, which is great. That's true. And 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 honestly, I think most of the most of the rule book itself, Mm -hmm. a a lot of it is just setting up the game. Right. Yeah. Because once you learn how to play, you're right. You can play it off of one page. Yeah. And, and a lot of it also shows you, like, where the little parts go back in the box and all the cool containers because there's this yeah. awesome insert that goes right inside the box oh. that has a place for everything. The box I control is that. phenomenal. I missed that diagram. I need that diagram. Oh, it's you, in there. Need, you do. It's in the book. I don't know how you would. Uh, I, I guarantee you <laughs> you're going to have an adventure when you find that now, diagram. Another tip. Another tip. If when you're poking out all the cardboard, because there's, like, two sheets of cardboard tokens and stuff. When you poke out all the cardboard, do not, do not throw away the cardboard sprues. Just like Uh-oh. your Small World game. Just like Small World, but although it doesn't tell you this in the box like it does in Small World. No, yeah. Save those sprues, 
when you put everything back in the box and all in the neat little containers, and you put the board back in, put the sprues on top, and they will hold the board down. So when the top is on, everything is going to be perfectly flush, and nothing can rattle around. Yes. Then you grab your Hugo's Amazing Tape and wrap it around the box really tight, <laughs> and now you can throw that baby in a backpack, and it'll be fine. Yeah, Curses. that's what I do. Yeah, I, I threw my sprues away. If you throw your sprues away, you can call up Battle Foam, and they'll send you a little foam insert that'll do the same thing. <laughs> uh, so, um, yes, but the uh, the bo- rule book is fantastic. The We've already talked about the crazy box design um, and the amazing box control. Now, there are five player mats in here that are nice. They're a little unusual. They're sort of thin and rectangular and tall instead of the usual yeah. sort of re- square things. Um, it's very cool. They're cool, and they give a spot for everything when you're playing. Be- what do you guys think of the game board in terms of art and layout? Um, I liked it. I thought, well, first, it, it's it's very clear to read. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of color to distract or that kind of thing. But in just you, you kind of get like the this, you know, kind of it's just kind of a sprawling city kind of thing, you know, seen from from above. And I, I think it was appropriate for it. Yeah, I, I like it. Uh, to me, it seems like it's it's working on two levels because it's very clear, as Kurt says, what each action area is and what it does and where you put your guy and what you get. But then beneath that is this is this 3D sketch almost map of the city that the that, that the action area fits into extremely nicely so that it, it's like, oh, that is a building and it goes here. And so there's there's a lot going on. That has nothing to do with gameplay. That's underneath that. That's just really interesting to w- look at and 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 appreciate on its own. Yeah, the art style is like that old medieval sort of art. You know, yeah, it reminds drawing. me a tiny little bit of Carcassonne. A little bit, yeah, like that. Look, yeah. I like it too. Um, you also get a bunch of building tiles, which are very thick uh, card stock that are used yep. for. Uh, Linen, buildings. thick linen, linen yep. card stock. You get lots of money tokens, and the money tokens are actually pretty cool. Instead of just they are very cool. circles, they're actually squares with little holes you poke out. So they actually sort of look like uh, almost a variant on Japanese currency, right? Or Chinese yeah. currency with the whole Or Chinese. Yeah. Uh, or Chinese, one of those Asian currencies. Yeah. Ian uh, knows the name of it. He's very impressive. Wow. Um, you get 100. I don't. You get lots of wooden bits, 130 wooden bits. You get cubes and little agent meeples. Oh, I like those. Yep. Yeah. And as, as Craig mentioned, you get 121... Ian called them d and <laughs> I like that. <laughs> d and um, You also get 121 linen cards. Um, and these are f- fall into three decks. You get an intrigue deck, a quest deck, and a rolls deck. These yeah. are, again, beautiful linen cards with awesome artwork from the various D&D lines. They look fantastic. Yeah. Um, now the whole thing, the suggested retail price is fifty dollars. Do you guys think that's a good value? I think it's crazy for fifty bucks. Yeah, I, I think um, I think this is pretty amazing. The, all the one, the quality of the components and the amount of the components. Uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. a good value. Yeah, I think only a company as big as Wizards could kind of pull this off, right? I mean, it's, yeah. it's and replay a bill. I mean, it's it's really got all anything that could add value is pen packed into that odd box. All right. And for fifty bucks, I think it's a great, great price. I think so too. I think the value's there. Most games of this level of, of wood, well, you look like a Gricola. You're talking, you know, twenty bucks more almost for right. I, yeah, I yeah. would say I would say you would expect to pay twenty to twenty five dollars more for right. this. Yeah. Uh, okay, so setup. So as as Kurt uh, mentioned, a, l- a large chunk of the book is dedicated to setup. It doesn't really take that long, but there's a lot of little nuances to it. So the first thing you're going to do is uh, flop out your board and. And oogle at its beauty, and you'll see there's different mm-hmm. locations and spots for all the deck. And it's one of those boards I like because there's a spot for everything on the board, right? There's a spot for all the decks. There's a turn counter built into the board. There's a VIP track around the edge. Everything has its place. And us little uh, uh, groundskeeping gamers just have a just have a little happy moment when we see that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, then after you flop your board out and they're done drooling on it, you uh, give each player. Um, they're agent meeples, and the number of agent meeples you start with is based on player count. And again, this is nice because not only is it described in the book, but also in the back of the book on the quick reference sheet, also that's there. So it's easy to remember. Well, in a two player game, everybody gets four, and in a four, five player game, everybody gets two. So basically, in lower player count games, you're going to have more of your, 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 your agent meeples, which are basically your workers, to be able to do more in a lower player count game. In a higher player count game, you're going to do less because everybody's going to be fighting for, for the territories. Scalability. Yeah. Indeed, right. Yep. Um, you can, um, oh, also there's a special spot on the board for everybody to put an extra meeple on. And, it, and because in the fifth round of the game, everybody picks up an additional worker meeple. So, yeah, which is a great idea, by the way. It is. It kind of it accelerates is. the game. So there's a spot on the board for all those. Interestingly enough, there's a spot for f- actually six meeples, but there's only five players supported by the game, which tells me what, Kurt? 
Uh, expansion, sir. <laughs> Indeed, expansion. <laughs> Forward thinking. I like the cut of their jib. All right, so uh, so that's going to be nice. Um, and uh, then you're going to do is you're going to shuffle up all the things that need to be shuffled. So there's the stack of buildings, right? We're going to shuffle that big card stack up, put it on the spot on the board. There's a quest deck. We're going to shuffle that up, put it in this quest deck spot. And there's the, the intrigue deck. We're going to shuffle that up and put that up there as well. After everything's shuffled, we're going to draw the top three buildings off the building deck and place them on the three spots in the builder's hall. And we're going to give each player a player mat. Uh, and that's, just, that's going to correspond to your color. You need to pick those. There's no... Uh, faction difference in the player match no. it's just, it's just but, fluff. but it's so cool i didn't even know this like until between playing with ian last night and then researching for rapid fire mm-hmm. what a rich background this game like the lords of Waterdeep is not something they came up with on their right. own. like they came up to make up with it like let's do a board game and call that it, it, there literally is this group called the lords of Waterdeep, mm-hmm. and they've been around for years and years and years in the fluff of the uh, of the forgotten realms and uh, and each one of the colors of the of your of your D and Deeples corresponds <laughs> like to one of these factions that have been around in the fluff, and they've got background, and they've got like all these cool different things. And in the game, they don't have any practical impact, really. But 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 like you got the Harpers, and the Harpers are these cool guys that are like allied to elves, and you've got the Red Sashes, and there you've got the Black Watch, and I mean there's all kinds of, or the City Watch, which is black something I don't know, but um, but yeah, I mean it's and it's it's so it's not just like oh I'm gonna be the blue, you're like you're gonna be the blue, you're gonna be these guys, and and it, there's like Russ said, there's no practical impact of gameplay but it's just this added element of the fluff that they've done a really great job tying it all in and kind of touching. Like, I mean, uh, one of the big complaints that I've heard, and it kind of makes me want to swats people, is, is like, it's just like three or four Euro mechanics with a very thin D&D skin. I'm like, I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, for the first time probably in my life, I'm looking at something that's that people are identifying as Euro going, yes, yes, I like that game. <laughs> and uh, I, I, whether it's thin, I don't think it's thin because with, with the colors and the factions and everything, they keep touching back to the, to the theme, which I think is great. So I love it. Now also, Craig, to, to, to reinforce your point, while there's very little text on the player mats, in the book there are actually two pages, full pages dedicated to showing pictures and artwork of each, each faction and yeah. a, a good two paragraphs of background on that faction. Very so cool. all that fluff is in there. It, it doesn't really have an impact on the game, but it is cool to see it there uh, as well. Um, and you're right. I think there's, there's a lot of theme here. It can be ignored or, or, or picked up as much as you like. Right. I played with players talk, who all I'll get into it. We'll talk about that later yeah, on. We'll talk about that later, but it depends on your player group, I think. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, but if, it's, it, if it inspires you, yeah. you should know that there are entire series of, of books, books oh, yes. based on this. Now, so everybody got their mat. And then also you're going to deal everybody a secret Lord card. Now, this card goes face down in a little spot under your mat. And from a pure game mechanics point of view, you're just going to look at the bottom of this card and figure out what your secret objective is, which will score you bonus victory points at the end of the game. However, the fluff pers- purpose of this card, there's a nice uh, artwork of a face of a, one of the secret lords of Waterdeep, and you that's who you really are. That's sort of your, the character you're playing, if you yeah. will, as the secret person behind the faction you're controlling. And again, uh, those are all actual characters from right. the background fluff. Right. And so... Typically, this is they're gonna they're gonna guide you as to try to solve certain quests or other actions. We'll get more of that in a little bit. Um, yeah. Then we're gonna deal out each player uh, two quest cards, and those are gonna go face up on a certain spot next to your mat, showing which quests you're currently trying to solve. More about quest cards a little later. And we're also gonna deal each player two intrigue cards. More about those later. And we're gonna um, also make sure the Cliff Watch Inn is populated. So remember, there's a deck of quest cards out there. We're gonna put four of those face up on the board in the Cliff Watch Inn, and that's gonna be a spot where we can go get more quests later. Yeah, that's an action area yep. for your D and Deeple. And we're gonna put everyone's victory point tracker, little wooden discs, uh, on the zero spot. And we're gonna put three victory point tokens on each of the numbers in the round track. There's eight I rounds. I love track. that. <laughs> and these these victory point tokens are gonna to be spread out later. I'll describe what happens later, but they're gonna be used to also attract the turns of the game. So you're it always gonna know So such a good uh, yeah. <laughs> where you are. Yeah. Um now we're going to determine who player number one is going to be. And the official rule on this is the person who's most recently been to another city. So, Kurt, when was the last time you traveled? Uh, that would have been GTS. Which was so, how, how long uh, ago? That was back in February. Okay, that's more recent uh-huh. than me. So, Kurt, you're player number one. So what happens now is 
each player is going to get their starting gold. Now, the starting gold is interesting. It varies depending on how far away from player one you are. So player one gets four starting gold. Everyone else gets four plus the number of seats he is away from player one. So player two will get five pieces of gold. Player three will get six pieces of gold and so on. So it kind of balances out the fact you're not going to go first. And be going first is kind of a big deal in this game because you're going to get first choice of where to place your workers, which as most people know from worker placement games, is huge because one of the big player interactions for worker placement is blocking out spots for other people to get. You want to get the good spot that you need first, right? Yeah. And that's set up. I know we talked a lot in there about different things, but really, it's not that hard. You flop out the board, you shuffle a few decks, lay a few things out in spots on the board, make sure everybody's got all their bits, and you're ready to rock. Yeah, and right. because the, lay, the, the box control is so good, you can literally leave most of the stuff in the box at the mm-hmm. beginning, other than the decks of cards and stuff, and take it out as you need it. Yeah, because there's there's a bunch of cubes in this box, right, that represent uh, different adventurers in this game. There's four different colors, and they're all got their own little pods in the box. And if you leave the box sort of like the banker on the side of the table there, you can just reach into the box and take out cubes and put them back in and keep everything sorted the whole game. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Uh, okay, so let's talk about how we start playing this game. Kurt, what is the goal of this game? Uh, the goal is to exert your influence uh, over over the town and send adventures off to do quests and uh, and by doing that you uh, you end up gaining uh, gaining points and you move your your points tracker around the board. Right. So the guy with the most victory points at the end is the wiener, <laughs> and the primary way, as Kurt said, to get points is to complete quests. Um, and what do you do to complete quests? Well, on your little quest cards, and remember, you're starting the game with two of these things face up next to your player mat. You're going to see a little needed section on the card next to some cool artwork uh, that's, that's sort of the fluff of the quest. And it's going to show some number of cubes of different colors. So it might show an orange cube, a white cube, and three black cubes or something, right? So cubes represent heroes, and the heroes in the game come in four types. you got your fighters who are orange, you got your clerics who are white, you got your mages who are purple, and you got your rogues who are black. Now, it doesn't really, you don't have to really memorize that because it just shows you the color cubes you need on the quest card. So once you've gathered the adventurers you need to complete a quest, you grab those cubes, you cash them into the bank, you complete your quest, and your quest scores you some number of victory points and other goodies. So most of the time, all you need is heroes to complete a quest, but sometimes you also need money to complete a quest. And that's right there on icons on the quest cards. It's really simple to see what you're trying to find to complete a quest. So the primary role of the game is figuring out the quest you have, what resources you're going to need to complete those quests, and then going into the city with your agents, gathering the resources you need to, to finish those quests. Right? That's pretty much right. it. Um, so what do we do? Oh, we're going to get ready to start. Before, at the very beginning of the turn, you're going to do some uh, start of turn stuff. What does that mean? Well, at the very beginning of the turn, you're going to take one of those little piles of victory points that's sitting on the on each of the turn rounds. So turn one, we're going to take the three piles off the, off the number one, and we're going to put one victory point on each building that's face up in the builder's hall. Okay, The builder's hall is basically three face-up buildings, and it's a market, Okay, trying to get people to come in there and buy a building. And because you're putting on a victory point on each building every round, Buildings that aren't bought are going to become more and more valuable because when you buy the building, not only do you get the building and the advantages, you're also getting whatever victory point tokens are piled up there. So over time, some buildings are going to become more valuable in terms of victory points and become harder and harder to resist. Right. Well, now, you, what you said made it sound like something that's not necessarily the case. When you buy the building, you don't get the advantage of the building. Well, you, you do get an ad- – everyone has access to the mm-hmm. building and right. the special power of that mm-hmm. building – but what's interesting about owning the building is that as the owner, there's a reward for when opponents use it. Right. Absolutely. That's yeah, that, yeah. Which is an awesome – which is why you want to get a bunch of buildings out there even if you're not the secret lord who really wants to build buildings. Mm. But, um, what, but what I meant was when you buy it, imme- you don't, there's no immediate reward other than those, those points right. and you now own right. that building. It's not like you – like if I build the building that when you put a – D and Deeple on there, you get two warriors and a wizard. I don't get two warriors and a wizard. I just now that's open to anybody, and if it, nobody uses it next turn, I can put a, a one of my agents on there and get that. So that's, yeah, the big that's thing. All what you're doing when you're buying buildings is um, you're you're banking on what people are going to need in the future, exactly. Uh, and then if they do use it, you get a side benefit when they use it as well for free. So there might be a building that says that whoever uses this building gets two rogues, but then in the bottom it'll say owner gets one rogue. So if Kurt uses the building to get two rogues and Craig owns the building, Craig will score one rogue for free because Kurt used his facility. So exactly. that's, what, that's why you'd want to buy buildings. <clears throat> Excuse yeah. me. And, so, and we should say there are, there are a lot of building tiles. Yeah. There's a and lot. So it's going to be a completely different game every time depending – like 
you could play your first game and there's this awesome building and you're like, yeah, that building's awesome. Well, you might not see it again for three or four games. And you're like, whoa, right. what the heck? Where'd that building go? So that's it's a- really it's that's just a really cool element. There's there's a lot of of cogs and wheels that go into the replayability, and that's a big one. Yeah. So, so right. Yep. So oh, go ahead, Kurt. No, I was, I was just agreeing. Right. So that so the start <laughs> of the tur- so tar- I appreciate that. Right. <laughs> so at the start of the turn again, we're just going around. We're making sure that we're putting the victory points on the buildings, and also uh, some buildings that might be in play have start of turn rules on them. So the for example, there's buildings that say uh, at the start of the turn put two gold pieces on this building and then so yeah. what happens is it basically builds up gold on if no one uses it it becomes more and more tempting to use that building to get a big pile of gold so the, each yeah. start of each turn you've got to look around the board uh, and make sure there's nothing you got to do for start of turn stuff and then each player after start of turn things are all done each player is going to take two actions right and really the actions are you get to assign an agent or a D&D meeple as Craig's calling them or you can complete a quest and and or you complete a quest so uh, uh, and it, actually, you can't complete a quest unless you've assigned an agent. Right. Correct. Right, right, right. Yeah. So every time you assign an agent, you have the option, option. of completing And it has to be after you do the agent, right? Yeah. You can't do it without. Yeah. So, so that's a what you do each quest. turn. And we're going to go around the table. Each person assigning agents. So we'll get more in detail how that works in a second. You go around the table. Each person assigning agents until everyone's assigned all their agents. And yeah. once that's happened, um, there's one last thing we got to do before the turn's over. We've got to look over at the, a special location called Waterdeep Harbor. Which is awesome. Now, Waterdeep Harbor's special ability is allows you to play a intrigue card. More about this in a second. It's the but, only place you can you, you play an intrigue card. Right. After you play the intrigue cards and after the whole round's done, then what happens is those meeples that are there get to be reassigned anywhere on the board. So we'll talk about that in detail in a second. Then the turn's over, and then everybody takes back all their meeples, and we repeat. We do start of round actions again, and we go around and just do assignments. And that's pretty much the core of the game. You're putting your guys down. Everybody's putting guys down, doing whatever their spot says. And then when all the guys are down to that, there's one section of the board called the Water Deep Harbor. We've got to reassign guys that are there. And then once that's done, it's over. You get another turn. Boom. Uh, now, the meat of the game, of course, is where you end up putting your guys. So basically, across the board, there are many different locations. And the majority of these locations are really simple. They have a cute little name. Like, uh, I don't know, Field of Valor. And under the mm-hmm. title Field of Valor, there's a little icon, which is where you put your D&D meeple, a little, a little outline of a meeple. And next to that, there's a couple icons of what you get for going to some place. So, for example, the Field of Valor has two orange cubes, which, as I mentioned earlier, are fighters. So if I put my meeple on that spot, I'm going to get two orange fighter cubes immediately. And my yep. action's done. So now it's Craig's turn to play somebody. I'm going to go to the plinth and get myself a cleric. Right. So some of the places give you one cleric. Some of the places give you one wizard, blue, like a, like a purple. And some of them give you a, a t- one or two rogues, depending on them. Some of them give I'm you money. Go, and I'm going to get money. Right. Yeah, there some of them go. give you money. Um, some of them give you. Sh- that would be like the shop of wonders or something like that. <laughs> I can't remember what it's called. Or the realm shop. Realm shop. That's it. There's the intrigue card spot, so that gives you a new intrigue card. Um, so you go there, you get your resources, it's over. And the icons make it really simple to understand what's going on. Now, there's a couple places that are a little fancier. The uh, first one is the good old Cliff Watch Inn. How does the Cliff Watch Inn work, Kurt? Well, Cliff Watch Inn, um, you have the, there are three spaces. Mo- most, of the, most of the places that you go, there's only a spot for one player. And once the player places there, you're locked out. Mm-hmm. Cliff Watch Inn has three such spots. But each of the spots does something a little bit different. So uh, on one of the spots, you get a uh, to choose one of the face-up quest cards that's in the Cliff Watch Inn. And, of course, you can see all those, so you can decide based on, you know, who your, who your lord is. Boy, you know, if, if you get a special bonus for Arcana and Piety quests, uh, then, you know, yeah, you're going you're gonna to choose one that makes sense for your lord. Plus, you get two gold. Right. Another one of the spots, you get one of the quest cards. And you get to draw an in, uh, a uh, intrigue card, and then on the third spot, um, you get to actually. If let's say you don't like any of the quest cards that are face up, you can reset, discard them, and redraw all four, and then choose a new one that's more to your liking. Indeed, yeah. and so the cliff watch in is very important because after you've solved the two quests you start the game with. You might want to go there to get more, or it may turn out the two quests you were dealt are too hard to do. You want to save them for later. So you want to go to the Cliff Watch Inn and grab a new one, or as 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 uh, Kurt mentioned, your lord, most of the lord's secret, ability, secret victory conditions are they're looking for you to solve certain types of quests, uh, fighter quests or um, arcane, uh, magic quests or stealth quests. 
Um, so you're trying to find those kind of quests and get those for bonus points. Um, also note, there's no limit to number of quests you can have face up next to your thing. You just kind of have more. And it's not this is not ticket to ride. There's no penalty for having unsolved quests at the end. So, But remember that every time you're putting your guy on the get a, get a uh, new quest card in the Cliff Watch Inn, he's not somewhere else gathering resources. So right. you don't want to throw your guy away constantly getting quests all the time if you're not solving them. That's the Cliff Watch Inn. Craig, how does the Builder's Hall work? All right. Well, the Builder's Hall is kind of interesting in that um, – uh, You've got uh, you've got your three buildings out there, and um, there's only one spot for a player to occupy, um, and the, the, there's a cost in the corner of the the building tile. So if you decide that yeah, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and build and own one of these buildings, it'll give you a cost in in money. So it might cost you four coins or eight coins or three coins. Um, so once you uh, once you actually buy the building. Uh, you you move it onto one of the side slots on on the board, um, and you get these little uh, little control tokens that match your uh, uh, your faction. So if you're the red sashes, you got a red one, and there's a really nice little die cut that it fits just you know catty corner into the bottom of the uh, the bottom corner that kind of establishes your ownership of that building. Mm-hmm. And then of course once Lovely. it's in play, um, anyone can then assign one of their agents there. Um, but only the owner gets the the little bonus, uh, you know, for uh, for opponents using it. So that's kind of neat. Yeah, and these buildings range in power from simply, you know, maybe the the default space on the board is you get two rogues, but there's a building that now you can go there and get four rogues instead, or uh, three two cubes of your choice instead of a pick fixed color cube, or even if you go here, you can immediately use any other space on the board that's already occupied by someone else. Oh, that's so, great! I love that one. Yeah, so there's some yeah. really there's some really nasty or and powerful buildings in there that you'll that two reasons you want to buy a building. One, there may be a building that increases the ability to get rogues per turn, and maybe your lord is someone that wants you to find. Uh, skullduggery. Skullduggery quests, which require lots of rogues, so so you want to have more rogue generation per turn. Or maybe there's just one you know, like like the one I like to buy is the one that lets you pick two cu- cubes of your choice because the owner bonus is you get one cube of your choice, and I know if I'm going to put that one out there, people are going to use that one. It's just too good to pass up. So I'm going to oh, get yeah. in a free cube of my choice every turn. So, And again, the value in these buildings, and, the, and as Craig mentioned earlier, the replayability here is that you want to get some of these buildings. They're only valuable early on sometimes. Some of them are less valuable later. So you're going to kind of fight for the big buildings early, and then as the game progresses, maybe the which, which buildings you want to see on the table sort of start to change. Yeah. I, I had a great one that uh, uh, at the beginning of every turn, it ended up gaining two, two wizards on it. Mm-hmm. And they would just keep on mounting, and someone until an agent landed there, they could collect anything. Whoa, that was whoa, on. whoa, family show! <laughs> what did I say? Oh, we're not going to go over it. Or just try to keep your mind out of the gutter, and let's move on. Rewind thirty seconds and change the context on that one. That was awesome. Uh, <laughs> that was great. So yes, yeah, so uh, anyway, uh, so yes, that is a very good building, Kurt. Good point. Good building involving mounting wizards. Okay, moving along. Uh, <laughs> I'll I'll never look at the building the same way again. Thank you, Kurt. Um, So that's the Builder's Hall. Now, that's one of the the more innovative mechanics, but another one that's really innovative is... I love Waterdeep Harbor. The Waterdeep Harbor. So, Craig, why don't you describe how Waterdeep Harbor works? Waterdeep Harbor has three different spots, and each is numbered one through three. And when you place your 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 uh, agent there, that's the only time in the game you get to play these intrigue cards. And the intrigue cards are awesome because they've got all kinds of different things. Sometimes you can get some some uh, some cubes. Sometimes you can get some money. Sometimes you can kill other people's cubes. Sometimes one of my favorites is mandatory quests, mm-hmm. which are these piddly little quests that almost always take one of each of three of the four cube types so if you're careful you look around and see what people have and then nail them with a mandatory quest and they have to go around and try to start collecting different cubes to try to do it because they cannot go on another quest until you do it and it's always just some piddly little two or four victory point quest so it's a huge pain in the butt to throw at people especially in the late game when people are you know, trying to get one last quest in to, uh, to jack up their victory points. So the intrigue cards are great fun usually to play. Um, and then the big deal is you get to play your, your, your intrigue cards, but then 
at the very end of the turn, you get to redeploy your agents that are in one of those three spots in the order that they were first placed in Waterdeep Harbor. So first person goes first, and the second one that hit Waterdeep Harbor goes second, and so on. And you get to put them anywhere on the board that's still available. So early on in the game, it's probably going to be more beneficial because later on when people have more uh, more agents, the, the territory start to really fill up. But it's a really cool way. That's usually the way I, I find that one of the action areas allows you to take the first player token and an intrigue card. Mm-hmm. That's usually when that goes, I notice. Usually, you, you usually there's more important stuff. You're trying to mm-hmm. get your your heroes. You're trying to get your 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 stuff. And then at the end, when you're reassigning guys away from Waterdeep Harbor, that's when usually that pl- person who's in that uh, that coveted first spot in Waterdeep Harbor lands on the um, on the uh, I think it's is it Waterdeep? It may be Waller, Waterdeep Palace that uh, that gives you the first player turn. Yeah, the first player yeah. tokens is cool. Castle Waterdeep, yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's a cool little uh, wooden, looks like a wooden chess rook, you know, piece that, that is the first player token. And the only way it changes hands is by going to that one spot on the board. Uh, and for, being first player is huge again because there's, as cool buildings come out, like the building with two, cu- choose two cubes, being first player to get that option is, is really huge. Um, yeah. And you're right, Craig, it's, it's awesome to see, be able to bounce around again and, and move around it. And lest you think, um, you know, as the game progresses, the good spots do get filled up, but also, if people are buying lots of buildings, there's actually more spaces on the board, too, you can use. So it starts yeah. to get sort of interesting where people go with those extra agents at the end. But it's really neat because the entry cards, as Craig mentioned, are really powerful. They add a lot of, of um, player interaction because the ones that uh, kill people, for example, will say things like, um, you know, everybody loses a black cube unless they can't, in which case they give you two to gold or something, or you get two gold. Yeah. Or... There's other ones that I really like, like you get two warriors and another player of your choice gets one warrior. Yeah, so you can like bribe. So people. now it's becoming, hey, I'll I'll give you one free warrior now if the next time you get a car with a bonus, you give me one. Or or again, playing those blocking quests, you know, you say, I'm not going to give you a mandatory quest because you gave me that warrior last turn. So there's definitely, that's where the alliances and the player interaction start happening is with these with these intrigue cards. Yeah, yep. and really important that the, my first game I I forgot about the redeploy. Oh yeah. Um, oh, so yeah. that that agent only just sat on Waterdeep Harbor, and that's not nearly as powerful when oh, yeah. it's you're relegated to no, just no, play that no. one yep. card. So remember yeah. that when you're playing. Actually, it's, a, it's yeah. a really important thing to remember because, as I mentioned, some of these cards give you guys. So if you're holding a card that says you know collect two fighters. Um, if you remember, if you go to Waterdeep, collect your two fighters, that guy could then redeploy, and if no one took the other fighter location, he could then go get you more fighters. So in, in one turn, you could be doubling up what you would normally really get without using your entry card. Um, so you really you really want to remember to, 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 play, to use those entry cards and then to remember to recycle your heroes. Um, that's a big deal, and it adds a lot to the game, and I think it's what, what kind of kicks it up a notch from maybe traditional worker placement a little bit. Um, so that's that's pretty much the whole game. Now, one... One thing we should talk about a little bit in more detail is maybe the quests. So yeah. as we talk, let's give some examples of quests. So what, when you're agent, after you play your agent, every time it comes around you play an agent, you have an option to solve a quest at that moment. As you guys yep. mentioned earlier, it's really strict. You have to play an agent. And it has to be after the agent to solve the quest. And all you really do is you look at your quest and then turn in the cubes you need to, to get it. Uh, and then you're going to move the quest to a special pile on your mat that says, you know, complete a quest, you move it face down there. Unless... Unless it's a plot quest. How do plot quests them. work, Craig? The plot quests are awesome because they have a continuous effect. Once you've succeeded in in achieving the plot quest, you move it to another... I mean, and the, the player mat is awesome because the... the uh, I mean, the graphic design of the whole game is inspired, mm-hmm. but um, the player mat is great because it literally tells you where to put all of your cards and tracks everything for you. So the plot quests go over on the right-hand side, and they slide under your mat so that only the the rule part can show. So it's just like a little tab on your on your player mat. And there's all kinds of really cool con- – the, there's one for each type of – or more, maybe more – there's probably more than one. But they're, they're, th- there's one type that gives you bonus victory, victory points every time you succeed in doing that kind of quest. So there's a commerce quest that once you do it, it's only worth eight. But it's worth two bonus for every time you do a commerce quest after that. Mm-hmm. Or my own personal favorite is um, 
the <laughs> which is awesome because once per turn you're you're allowed to put your meeple where somebody else already has a meeple. So yeah, there's you you can't get locked. There's a couple different ways you can do that in the game, and one of them is one of these plot quests. And um and there's other plot quests. There's one plot quest that gives you one cube of any kind you want at the beginning of every turn. Mm-hmm. And so there's all kinds of really the plot the plot quests are yet another way that the game's going to be totally different every time you play. Because yep. you're gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna come up with these plot quests, and some of them are so cool. Like we t- talked about earlier, your that your Lord of Waterdeep card is going to make you predisposed to focus on usually two types of quests, and the quests break down into uh, warfare, piety, um, skullduggery, arcana. Uh, commerce, right? And arcana is that it? Or, and arcana, yeah. and um, and but there's some some that are so cool, and you get bonuses at the end. You get usually dependent upon your card, your lord card. You get like plus four for every of the two types that that particular lord um, focuses on. But for instance, I had skullduggery and commerce last night, and the I got the uh, I I saw a chance to get the orb of the mag- magister. And I was like, oh, I have to do it. So I went and I did it, even though I wasn't getting any bonus victory points because that's just an awesome ability so that nobody can lock you out. And I used it every turn after that, yeah. uh, especially in a five-player game from turn f- in the second half of the game when everybody's running around with five uh, D&D pulls, It gets mighty crowded mighty fast. Well, they should, so, only, they should only have three in a five-player game. But, yeah, it still gets pretty good. Then the no, other, yeah, you're right. You're right. But, you're but right. then the other thing that's cool is, though, you can get up to five, though, because one of the plot quests also gives you an extra meeple. Oh, that's so which is, hard. Which though. is awesome. And then there's a building where if you take it, you get a, another meeple yeah. next turn, the ambassador. So there's there's a couple of ways where you can get some bonus meeples, which really starts crowding the board up, which is cool. And Now, explain, but if we can, just for a moment, there's a building yeah. that if you go there, you get... A, 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 an agent. Right. But you had to spend an agent to get the agent. Right, but the agent's there for you next turn. Oh, so, it's next turn. Yeah, so what happens is, let's say oh. you got locked into the inn, right? Gotcha. And there's nothing yep. cool left. You go there, next turn you're going to have a bonus meeple. I got and, it. I got it. Okay. And, That's only ever po- Again, the replayability is crazy. But, that that building has only popped up once in but seven But here's the real I've bonus. Played. That meeple gets deployed before the first player goes. Oh, that's right. I remember that. So yeah, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. even worth it, even if you're losing a guy because you're right, going to get first right, turn right. next yep. turn, even if the other guy stole the first turn token. So it's kind of a yep. big deal. Yeah, I remember now. Yeah, um, that guy was awesome. Yeah, that guy's awesome. So, so as Craig mentioned, there's a bunch of quest types, and watch your roll card, right? So look at your lord. Most of the lords are looking for two different kinds of, of, of quest types. So you want to be nailing those, those quests and getting them in. Um, and... Just again to bring the theme back, these quest cards aren't just you know the, the the stats on them. There's a beautiful piece of artwork on every card, and there's a beautiful little uh, sentence or two that just describes in fluff that what your what the mission is. You know, yep. knock the goblins out of a nearby cave, or or suppress the thieves in the in, in the nearby alleys, or whatever it is. And it just it really brings you into the game more and reminds you that you're sending on warriors. And it makes sense. You'll see a skullduggery quest, and it'll require like you know five rogues to go solve and the next minute you'll have like you know recover some trapped paladins you need two warriors and two clerics and that kind of thing it's yeah. pretty cool um so what do you think of the quests there kurt any comments um you know i i think it's uh, i think it's really interesting um the i think they, they they took some nice time and attention to like try to try to you know thread the theme through yeah so you know in, in the end, it really is just kind of a, a resource management game, and you are really just you know getting you know the little wooden cubes just like a, a standard euro. But in this case, you know, let's say it, you've got an, an Arcana quest here, and you know it's it's called domesticate owl bears. Well, <laughs> what do you need to domesticate owl bears? <laughs> well, according to this card, you need a cleric and two powerful wizards. <laughs> So thematically, you can kind of say, yeah, okay, to kind of teach owlbears a lesson and keep them in line. Sure, I'd buy that. Um, and, of course, then you get, you know, a reward. So, you know, you get uh, eight victory points. Um, a fighter comes out of that and two gold. Um, that's so, not just a fighter. Because uh, so, now you've got a trained owlbear. I was going to say, thematically, that's an owlbear. Bear. That's yeah. one owlbear added to your life. <laughs> so it, 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 it kind of makes sense in a, right. in a certain way. And I think they've done a nice job of kind of threading all that kind of nice theme through what is essentially, you know, a, a pretty solid euro. 
Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. awesome. So when your wizards aren't mounting, they're training owl bears. That's an important note. Yes. Well, mine do both at the same time because wow. I have talented wizards. <laughs> okay, TMI. TMI on the wizards and owl bears. Well, I was gonna say, right, does that make them? Um, oh no. Does that make them uh, battle wizards at Mount Skullfire? Um, from what I've seen, yeah, pro- probably could do pretty well over there. <laughs> Okay, well, we got to get to our final thoughts here. Wrap this baby up, yeah. uh, Craig. Uh-huh. Before we get to our final thoughts, we probably should describe the uh, the rating system here uh, for new listeners jumping in at episode one hundred and one here. Oh, okay. so, yeah, and 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 important that I understand it since I'm going to have to rate. Right, ah, right. So, yes, Craig, okay. in the style of a drow lord, hmm. please describe the patent pending D six G rating system. Well, it's interesting that you should say drow lord as there are. No drow, but uh, as you know, the slaves of the drow uh, last longer than they're allowed to live longer, the more amusing they are. And so uh, we drow lords like to, when, we, when we're having our dinners and, and our banquets, we like to banter back and forth over who has the most amusing slaves. And we like to rate them, and when we rate them, we rate them on a scale that is not unlike the human movie rating scale in the reverse, in that the number, rather than a higher number, you want a lower number for your slave's amusement factor. So, for instance, if your slave is very amusing, you might say, you know, five out of six of my guests will find the slave amusing. Well, rather than five out of six, you're actually going to say two plus. So as if you're rolling a die, a bone, as we like to call it, because we do make them out of the bones of living slaves, actually. And we roll that die, and, then, and any result of a two or higher, you would say, yes, now I'm going to be abused by that slave. Uh, somebody's breathing heavily as And I have to thank you. Please. And so, of course, sometimes you're torn, and you, you, you're finding yourself in a really dismal middle ground, and that's when we say a reroll would come in handy. So you might say a four plus with a reroll, and of course, mathematically, that makes it better than a three plus. But we're the drow lords, and we can say whatever we want, and math really means nothing in the dark. So uh, we consider that a four and a half, and that, my friends, is how a drow lord. Rates its for nice, nice. Actually, I had a drow lord in the last water deep. That was my secret agent. Did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did too. Uh, yeah, huh? and um, drow is on my mind because at PAX, uh, which is to the coast, had oh the big, dry the drider the, the, the rise of the underdarks coming out, and they were promoting it. But not only that, I'm looking at the um, the loth for president buttons they were handing out. <laughs> they, they had great posters. Loth for president. The choice you'd make if you had a choice. <laughs> Loth for president, weaving your future in 2012. Oh, that's, very that's nice. Awesome. So yeah, so Loth for president. There you go. So um, Kurt, why don't you start off as the guest? What were your final thoughts on uh, Lords of Waterdeep? I'm still trying to figure out the rating system. Uh, no. lo- lower is better. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> um. So here's the thing. I I had a lot of fun playing. As did uh, as did the folks at my table. Um. I uh, I. I had heard that the the game was, um, you know, this fusion of Euro game and thematic game or Ameritrash or however people like to, you know, talk about it. And my one word of caution I think I throw out to people is that I don't know that it really is a fusion. I think it is a really solid, solid and enjoyable Euro that has... Um, instead of you know sheep and wood, you know you you're you're talking about stuff that appeals more to thematic or uh, you know Ameritrash players. So it's really nicely crafted and, and gilded onto the game. It, it feels natural as a as an extension of the game. But we're not really talking about an Ameritrash game. This is a really nicely constructed euro game that's got some uh some nice theme to it um for that i i i really i gave it um i i'm guessing i'm, I'm giving it a, a two then really 
Ooh. Oh, that's a good roll. That's the highest rating you can without a reroll. Oh, is, is, is that the that's case? Like a, that, that's like a four and a half out of five stars. Yes. Is basically what that looks like. Okay. Well, so yeah, I, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty close there. I thought it was a really satisfying, uh, Euro. Okay. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Craig, you want to go next? Or you want to go last? Uh, no, I'll go last. Okay. Um, I agree with you, Kurt. I think the the part that makes it feel a little bit like an a, a Ameritrash game to me is that I think there's a little more interaction than you might get in a Euro um, with the addition of the intrigue cards, right? So, like, um, normally in a Euro, like, I'm thinking of, like, Pillars of the Earth or Kalos, where the primary interaction is simply blocking each other out. Yeah. Um, there's that addition of the, of, the interact, of, the, of the intrigue cards that kind of says... Well, I'm blocking you out, but also you thought you were about you thought you were safe and had all that stuff in your little bank over there. But now I'm going to steal a paladin, you know, whatever. Um, and so I like that. Although you're right, it really in the end it's it's a it's a worker placement euro with a really beautifully themed and awesome D and D artwork, which there's nothing wrong with that. So, that, but that is uh, I'll agree with that. I think the game has it all. I mean, if you're not um, compartmentalize it or not into into whatever type of game it is, I think it's got fantastic graphic design. I think the Box control is great. I mean, you know, the box insert is fantastic. You don't really see that in games except for maybe something out of uh, out of um, a Days of Wonder with this many components and, and things. Or yeah. Cutthroat Caverns, nice, nice stuff. With, or Hex Hex, I was thinking. Hex Hex XL, nice one. Um, easy, very easy to learn. Um, I, I can't think of another game where I sat down with five players. I mean, I, I bought this game on an impulse. So I grabbed it off the shelf just because I like D&D and I'm kind of a sucker for D&D stuff. So I grabbed it, sat down with, with four other people, so five players. None of us had seen the rules before. I didn't even know what it was about except that it had a cool-looking box. Popped it open, poked everything out. We played the entire game with five new players in an hour and a half. And after turn one, we were all playing strat- strategically because we figured the rules out. There's not too many games you can do that with yeah. Um, yeah. and really be confident about. So that's really, I think, a big plus for it. Um, lots of great decisions. It doesn't feel like... You know, one of the complaints about some Euros is you don't have enough actions you can do per round. I don't really get that feeling with this game. I feel like there are only eight turns, but it still feels like there's plenty to do. Maybe it's because you get that extra worker at turn five. I think that was kind of a nice a nice addition. Yeah, that, uh, that's actually pretty key. And I, I think you're right. You know, the, you really do feel like, you know, even even if you've got, you know, your your three agents, your your meeples that you're, you're moving out, even three per turn, you feel like, I'm able to achieve enough that it's satisfying each turn. Yeah, you know, you're yeah. building towards that goal. Yeah, and uh, and so you know, for those reasons, I think yeah, it's and and you're right. It's I thought it was really easy to learn. Um, I did end up deciding to watch a video review of uh, of play mm-hmm. because I think it really it you know once you set up the board and know where everything is, the actual learning of the game is pretty intuitive, and uh, and I, I found that like a, a video review really helpful just to kind of like so you can see where all the pieces are as they're kind of talking yeah. through. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. I do like the video stuff too, um, yeah. and yeah, I think I think the way they help that that the actions per turn is also helped by um, you know getting to replace the guy that does the entry card right. That yeah. that worker's worth two workers, so really you're getting three placements uh, you know in the, in the end game plus a fourth for that guy plus there's buildings to give you an extra meeple so. You do kind of get a lot more decisions per turn. Um, I think the, th- the theme's perfect for someone like me. I think it's a great way to get, you know, it- it's hard sell for farming for some people, right? But to be able to say, hey, we're going we're gonna to be lords of a, we're going to be political intrigue lords in the Dungeons and Dragons universe and sending paladins off and, and uh, mounting up our mages that get tackle bugbears, you know, that mm-hmm. all can happen and it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but, you know, interesting. See, see, because I, I agree. I think, I think people will get into it. Um, you know, for that reason, they'll they'll want to sit down and play it and expose themselves to a really nice euro. Oh, not where, again! Come on, <laughs> <laughs> they might not normally. If it was, if it was, you know, again, I'm I'm collecting bricks and wood. Right. But um, what's interesting is when I was sitting down and playing with people, um, the theme quickly got kind of lost on a couple of players. I kept, I was always the one who was like, you know, oh, I'm going to be domesticating owl bears with my Claire <laughs> and two right. wizards. And everyone else is just like, okay, here's my uh, my two purple and my white and I'm going to now get these points and this stuff. Right. Yep. And you know, to to me, if it, if it if it was like a fully integrated blended thematic, you know, pe- people should be talking about this in those terms all the time. And I I feel like that's that's why I think it really does lean more on on the euro side of the yeah. equation because in the end, that's that's what's really kind of going through your your head rather than like the thematic p- 
pieces. The thematic pieces are great, but it, you don't have to use them at all to play. Well, and that's actually right. that can that's double sided. I agree with you. It's 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 definitely not you know like Wrath of a Shardalon or you know the Legend of Dritzt or Ravenloft where you're in a dungeon crawl and you know you're playing a Dungeons and Dragons game and you're yelling charge, kill that bugbear, you know. Um, but at the same time, um, one of the nice things about it is. Let's say you're a Dungeons and Dragons fan and you want to play a D&D game or you have this game, but you want your wife to play it or some non-gamers to play it with you. It's got the, the, the mechanics also that you can do that and you're not forcing them to understand Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, absolutely. Um, and that worked yeah. really well. My wife really likes this game. Um, we played it. My brother, uh, who's a D&D guy, but his wife is not a gamer at all, but she likes Pillars of the Earth. You know, She likes a lot of card games. Um, it went over great with them. So it's a nice game that you can actually get gamers into, I think, based on theme, because, you you know, it is D&D, &D and there's great artwork in there, but also you can get sort of maybe some non-gamers in there, so it kind of does does both do both those things. But I agree with you, Kurt. It's def we don't want to oversell the fact it's not really Ameritrash meets Euro. It's really Euro meets a D&D &D theme. It's right. really what yeah. it is. Yep. Um, and I do like the D&D &D marriage with, with the Euro theme here. I think you do God do well. Um and um, I know that some people have been saying on the Board Game Geek, you know, well, the mechanics have all been seen before. They do this in Kalos. They do that in something else. Yeah, but I think the way it's completely packaged and plays so cleanly and looks so good and the components are so great make it a really unique experience. And probably, you know, I have a good gamer friend of ours, Chuck, who, who sent in some, some contest entry last episode. For years, Chuck's been telling me, last two years, he said, you got to try Stone Age. you got to try Stone Age. My favorite workplace placement game ever. He just told me the other day, this has replaced Stone Age for me. This is now my favorite oh, worker yeah. placement game. So it, that's a good thing. Yes, it borrows mechanics from other games, but it's probably one of the best implementations you're going to see of some of these mechanics. And so for that reason alone, I think it's worth a look for even yeah. a diehard. And combinations. Game. Yeah, right, and combos. And I think really if you look back at this, I think Wizards of the Coast has really raised the bar on their board game productions with this thing. I think this thing can stand up next to you strongly next to a, a game like Small World or some of the fantasy flight titles or from other big publishers and say, look, this is a really good quality board game uh, that any company would be proud to make. Yeah. Um, and I so, echo that. And that, and that I think is interesting because uh, a little aside here, I was at the PAX East D&D panel and they're talking about 5e and what they were doing with the new D&D next. And they said, you know, one of the things we're, they're kind of excited about is all these D&D &D board games are, are making a lot of money for the D&D &D license. And what, the, the the RPG developers were saying was it's actually taking the pressure off of us to figure out how to make the maximum revenue possible for D&D &D, the RPG and make D&D &D RPG the way the RPG we want it to be for our fans. Now, cool. that could be marketing speak, but that's kind of exciting to hear. Basically, they're saying, look, the pressure's off now. We've we got these great board games that are making huge amounts of money. Now we can make the D&D &D RPG we've always wanted to make. So that's mm -hmm. kind of interesting. We'll see if that really happens, but it's sort of interesting that they're able to sort of diversify their revenue streams from the D&D &D license, which is sort of interesting. Cool, so, yeah. Now, what would you rate it? Uh, I'm with Kurt. I, I, I'm almost going to give it a two. I, I'm going to give it a two plus no reroll. I, this is, wow. I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't met someone who doesn't like this game yet. I have not met no, someone who does no, not like this game. That's true. Yep. Okay. Well, everything that Russ said, I, I say too, as well as everything that Kurt said, except for his foul stuff about wizards and things Exposing like that. themselves now? Exposing yeah, I, themselves? I know. To it's crazy. I even, it's family game. Family, family show. But anyway, um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about uh, how to play this game with your worker placement game enjoying but eight, but D and D averse wife or significant other. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, Karen hates Dungeons and Dragons to the point where I hid the box cover from her <laughs> the first time we played. All I told her was, "Hey, there's a game. It's kind of like Pillars of the Earth and Kingsburg, which are two of her big favorite games." And uh, and and I don't even know the Kingsburg thing. Somebody else mentioned that. So uh, how is it like Kingsburg? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, because you you got worker placement. placement. Okay, you're right. placing your die, right. your dice, and you're closing okay. people out of options. You, you can see it a little bit, but okay. anyway. Um, so, so this is this is the key. You don't have adventurers. You just have cubes that are specific colors. You don't have a lord or roll card. You have an end of game bonus card. <laughs> and ignore the fact that those say quests. It's, they're just goals. You don't have there to worry about it, what a quest is. It's just those are your goals. Those, the, you need X number of these colors. Exactly what Kurt said when when he said that you know it's the theme is just is, is just laid over the top. It's not like you need to know that you're you're going and subduing bugbears. That 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 would lose my wife. 
So what I say is, okay, so for this one, you need uh, a white and two purples, and you get eight victory points and uh, and an orange cube. Good job, honey. <laughs> Uh, and she loves it. She uh, well, she doesn't love it. She said she'd rather play uh, Pillars of the Earth, um, but she's willing to play this with me. And I don't really want to play Pillars of the Earth, so that works fine. For oh, and aside, just to, you reminded me of this, and I wanted to mention it. My brother and his sister uh, and his wife, my sister in law, really, we the four of us with Nicole have played Pillars of the Earth quite a bit, and they really like Pillars of the Earth. After yeah. playing this game, though, they feel like it's easier to play than Pillars of the Earth, but it's a more strategic game than Pillars, if that makes sense. I so, think that's both, those are both accurate. So there's statements. an example of folks who like Pillars, and I like Pillars a lot, don't get me wrong, but they're, they're thinking this is a stronger game than Pillars for both of us. Easier to play, faster to play, but still just as enjoyable with more options. So yep. no, I think go. that's absolutely true. Um, so for me, I love everything that the other two guys have already said, but for me, the ultimate thing I think that, that makes this a game I want to play is the built-in clock. Mm. It's the uh, the graphic design of every turn you t- every uh, you got all eight turns and each turn space on the board has a stack of victory points on it three victory points and each turn at the beginning of the turn they each go onto the buildings like Russ said so that all you've got to do is look at that track you immediately know how many turns there are left and you immediately know when you get your bonus meeple in turn five. And 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 it and it just goes along. It's the time limit makes the game way more intense, and it speeds everything along. Um, it does, however, make uh, as I said, uh, analysis paralysis even more annoying. When you're like, yeah, it's a fun game. It's only going to last an hour, and then you've got somebody who's just staring at the board, going, oh, but if I do, oh, but if I do this, oh. And I've gotten to the point where I'm like, it's a what you're trying to do is very simple. The options for your agent placement are very clear. If you can't see a way to do it, it probably means there's not a way to do it. <laughs> so, the, so I've 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 had moments where I've like I've I've had to say that, and I was rude. I admit it. But I'm like, <laughs> come on, if we do this, we can get into game of summoner war summoner wars before the end of the night. But anyway, <laughs> um, I played seven times, and never once has it been even close to an hour and a half for me. It's been it's always been within an hour, hour and 15 ma- minutes, maybe depending on how many new people you have. So it it goes very fast. At, at the same time, you've got all these options, which I love. And the, that's what I don't like about normal euros is that I, I need to do A, B and C and I can't. I just don't have what I need with this game. Mm-hmm. You need to do yeah. A, B and C. But you know what? If you can't do it, there's always you go to the inn, the watch cliff inn. And get a new quest, and then you you opened up your goals all over again. You've got a whole bunch of new stuff that you can do. So it it's like I never feel like you know, oh, I've got myself into a corner, and now I need to do this, and I can't, so I'm done. You know, there's never that moment because you can always you can even go up, wipe out all the op, all of the offered quests, and find a new one. I mean, it's there's always there's always something you can do that can move your game forward. So that I, from my perspective, you guys can can speak whether or not this has been your experience but you're tracking the victory points as you go on this awesome track around mm-hmm. the outside of the board but that's almost a complete like there's so many things at the end that will add victory points to you and what you're doing and there's so many like 25 victories you, you can get 25 victory points from one good quest yes so looking at from one moment to the next from one turn to the next who's in the lead is almost no indication of who's going to win the game because there's so much other well, stuff going on brings, underneath the surface. Frank, I'm going to agree with you, and this is the other thing that makes it feel a little bit like an American game to me, is that there's a meta game that goes on. I, I like when I play American games, I like to be not in the lead most of the game, and I found that's the same strategy with this game. You want to be at the back because you're at the bottom of the of the of the victory track, but you're holding on to some secret things like a really good lord bonus, or yeah. you've got a bunch of quests on the side that aren't solved yet, but you've got all the resources to bang them out quick near the end. That's huge because when you're at last place, players are more likely to give you the benefit of their intrigue cards. Oh, right. I have this extra fighter. I'll just give it to Russ. He's in last place. Oh, yep. I have this extra wizard. I'll just give it to Russ. He's in last place. And then all of a sudden, the end of the game, boom, 25 points. Boom, 25 points. Boom, another yep. 20 points. Oh, look at my Lord bonus. 30 more points. Oh, did I just win? Oops. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. You know yep. so there's definitely that American meta game that's, that's the, the unlike some Euros where you kind of know where you stand throughout the game all the time. This yeah. has got this little, tr- and it also keeps you on your toes, though. You can't ever be sure who's in the lead is actually winning at this moment, which is kind of right. Neat. Yeah, I well, love it. And that's governed a little bit by the fact that you can only complete a quest 
whenever you place an agent. So right. at any given time, you know exactly how many opportunities someone mm-hmm. has to get those things That's played. That's true. That's right. true. Yeah. Yep. So it's not like you can you can hoard all those things and just say, oh, I'm going to cash them in at the end. Yeah, but there's right. nuances yeah. that too. What? Because there's, there's actually a building, though, that lets you put a meeple on it and you can immediately take a quest on the quest board and solve it instantly. Yeah, which doesn't account against your solving for. So there are there's still tricks, but you're right. I mean, you're right. But there yeah. there are these but little that, nuances that, that also surprise people too. Which that is. yeah, that's my point. Is there's so many different right. little things that break a little tiny rule, right? You know, but that but totally change the game up. That you can you can never really be confident of what's going on, and um, I think it scales extremely well. A two player game when Karen and I are playing, we're having a lot of fun. It's a different game than five players, but it's still a whole lot of fun. Right, and I think. As I think we've all said, the the learning curve is very shallow. It, you're, you are very quickly up to speed and playing a strategic game. And, of course, the more often you play, the more you see the different building options and the different quest options and the different lords that are out there threatening you. So you have a better idea of what people are going for. And, you know, now we're playing – I'm playing my fifth, my sixth, my seventh game – now I'm starting to notice, oh, crap, Ian's going after Skullduggery, too. Oh, I got to try to stop him, and that's what I want. And so, I mean, you're learning, and the game's getting deeper as you're playing, but it's still the the, the basics of it are very simple. Uh, the very first time I played Karen, it was my fourth game, her first game, and I, and I crushed her, which is not something to brag about. <laughs> uh, but the very next time we played, which was my sixth game and her second game, I only beat her by two points, and it was what we just said. It was a really lucky quest pull at the very end in the very last turn. And if I hadn't got that quest and been able to solve it, she would have beaten me by 23 points. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a really close game. Um, most of the times that I've played, it's, it's not a walk away for anybody. So I will say I have not yet played this game. I've played this game with people. Every time I've played it, someone who I've played with has bought it after I played it. And I've never played it with anybody who didn't enjoy it immensely. And and that includes people who are Euro gamers who are saying things like, well, it's not my favorite Euro, but it's the Euro that all of my friends seem willing to play. Right. Yeah. So so even when it's not – like you, you could be a connoisseur of Euro games, and if this is the Euro the rest of your friends are going to play, it seems like this is good enough that you can have a lot of fun – because it's the one your friends want to play. So I am going to go with a 2-plus with a reroll also. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Wow, that could be one of the highest rating games ever. I, it, it could. I'm telling you, this. I have played this game more than any other board game that I have bought. I think uh, that's, well, if we don't count things like Hex Hex uh, as a board game. Uh, and, and why and, not? Kurt, you should be standing up for this. No, it's why a card. Why do you not count right, Hex Let him go. <laughs> it's a card game. <laughs> um, but, but seriously, like I don't know of a game that since we've started this podcast that I bought so early in the excitement factor and have played so much and still want to keep playing as much as I did when I first bought it. So yeah. I would, I would say it well deserves to be one of the highest rated games we've, we've reviewed. Excellent. Well, there is water deep Kurt. Thank you so much for yes, joining Kurt. us on episode 101. Yeah. Thanks I, for all the time and effort. Yeah, no, it's, it was been fun. And, uh, and, if I had not done it, I might not have been pl- playing Lords of Waterdeep. So oh, there, there you go. go. Thank you. See? And, and, and Kurt, thanks for making so those, all those great games at uh, Smirk and Dagger. Where can people go to find out more of the new hotness coming from Smirk and Dagger and all that good stuff? Uh, well, then come to my website at uh, smirkanddagger.com. They can probably also stop by and see you guys. <laughs> Yes. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. Yes. When, if you're at Adepticon, come and see us. We'll have all the hotness and we'll be playing it. Yeah, we'll have Smirk and Dagger stuff there. Don't worry about that. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Kurt, for coming on. We really look yeah. forward and to Kurt, seeing you again. Thank you very much for trying to rein in that mouth of yours. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's hard to control. Me. Average success, but I appreciate the effort. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks again, guys. Bye bye, Kurt. Bye bye. This edition of Jever Notice is brought to you by Ben from Melbourne, Australia, who has been moved to shout out in the form of a haiku. Century gone by, long hours of time spent in quiet, a short laugh bursts out. That was lovely, Ben. Thank you for supporting the show and taking the time to compose a poem. Did you ever notice how getting into a new big miniatures game is a lot like falling in love when you're younger? Seriously, I mean... 
the similarities are startling. Think about it. At the very beginning, that new game seems perfect. At the very beginning, that new game keeps your attention despite all your efforts. You might try to, to, to be coy. You may try not to look at it, not to walk over to it, pick up the box, look it over, look at the back of the box, you know. But then again, there you are holding the box in the middle of the store, hoping nobody notices because you've got so much unpainted stuff for other games already at home. The new game gets all your attention instead of all of the other games. You start thinking about it. You start looking for it online. You start talking about it to your friends. In fact, you want to talk about the new game all the time. You don't want to talk about anything else. You keep talking about the new game. You keep talking about what kind of armies they have in the new game. You talk about how cool the fluff is in the new game, how innovative the mechanics are in the new game. It just goes on and on and on. You desperately want everyone to like the new game as much as you do because that will validate your opinion of this game. Well, here we go again. We have a unique perspective, I think, this time around because of the way we do the show now. As most of you know, we uh, record every week, so we don't stay up till midnight, although we stay up close to midnight, so I'm not sure. It, it's bad time management, but uh, but we we record every week. So basically what you get over the course of a, of a show now, one episode, you get two weeks worth of our life experiences sort of informing the show which is why some things I think are more intensified because instead of just whatever's been bothering us one night, you get whatever's been bothering us two, week, two, you know, two weeks straight. So it's kind of intriguing. Uh, but this time around, what you're actually getting is the first mention of a new minigame through the intense obsession of starting out all in one episode because of the one-week schedule. Uh, Russ and I played Dust Warfare at Gen Con with Ross Watson, and we had a really good time. It was neat. You know, it was a light, fluffy um, demo level of the game, but it was fun, and the models were cool. The models were awesome. They were the deluxe painted models that you can buy for, generally speaking, about three times the uh, the cost of the uh, original models, but they look beautiful to the, a ridiculous level of detail. Um, and we were pretty excited about it. Russ, was, in particular, was very excited because he's a big Andy Chambers fan. And as some of you that are more steeped in the esoteric levels of knowledge in uh, minigaming goes, Andy Chambers, you know, was was a big guy over at GW and then had a huge creative falling out and immediately went on to create... Uh, Starship Troopers, another game that Russ loved. And Russ would tell you, if you would stand still for five seconds, how Starship Troopers was the game 4th edition 40K should have been, and that's why Andy Chambers probably left. Uh, but for a variety of reasons, Starship Troopers didn't quite make it, didn't quite cut the bill, or fit the bill. And, uh, and so there it goes. But now here's Andy Chambers again coming up with this rule set, which has a lot of similarities in, in theory, not so much in mechanics, but in the, in, in the things that he wants the rules to do. Uh, and so Russ is now like, well, this is what 40K 5th edition should be like. And so he, he talks about it a lot, and, uh, and, and, and we were very excited about it. So uh, it fell off the radar anyway because, um, you know, a lot of the stuff that you see at Gen Con that doesn't immediately come out, you know, there's a million new hotnesses that come along and take its place in your brain. Uh, Christmas time came around, and Myriad had a great deal for D6G listeners. The original core set of Dust Tactics with, that uses the exact same models that Dust Warfare design, is designed to use for $50 instead of $100, which is crazy because it's got about $200 worth of models in it. And Russ and I both almost did it, and we didn't, and now we're paying so fast forward to right about now, Russ last weekend gets the rule book at PAX East and immediately starts talking it up on the email threads. Everything K, 40K, 4th and then 5th could have been and should have been and drums up a little support through the local Myriad community. And, and you can tell that he's really, really excited about the fluff and the storyline and the models and everything. Uh, I, the brave individual, the warrior standing strong in the face of temptation, refuse to yield. That's Monday. 
Tuesday, Russ and I talk a bit, and I ask him, you know, should I really go and get the original, the $100 original starter? Because Mirian had five left. Uh, it contains way more models than the new revised core set, uh, which costs like 80 And then I go to the store that night, and I hold it in my sweaty hands, and I deny temptation because I am stronger than that. Then Russ has something that he needs to get to me, and he games on Thursdays now, so I swing by the store on Thursday, and he and Ryan are playing Dust Warfare. And I look at the models, just primed now, because the deluxe set, remember, costs over $300. Russ is hilarious. I don't think I've ever seen him so excited about a game. He bought the $100 starter, then he bought another box, then he bought the large walker, and he bought all the custom battle foam loadout for the original core set, and he's willing to go in halvesies with me on the revised core set because it's a totally different group of models. Because by now, my ability to withstand the Jedi's strength is wearing paper thin. I can't do it anymore. I buy the $100 set. With the understanding that Ryan will at the same time and will maybe trade off the factions later, uh, I make a deal with Russ to split the revised starter, and I'm off. I don't even own the rule book. It's not even available to me yet, but now I'm all excited too. I want everyone else to be excited. I'm painting like a fiend. It helps that the models come assembled and pre-primed, but still. And yet a little piece of me remembers that it was Russ that got me all excited about Arcane Legions. And I admit to a slight tremor of trepidation in my heart. But that's just like love too, right? Uh, You won't know till you take the plunge, and as Forrest Gump says, by then it's too late. But I'm jumping in, and so far, I'm really liking the ride. Uh, I was going to do this entire Jeffrey Notice actually on uh, how great the greater gaming community can be when it comes together and how great folks within the community have been to us and to each other over the last four years. Uh, I wanted to give another mention to Kurt and Steven and Dan uh, and others, and I will here consider yourselves mentioned, guys. Quite literally, we could never do this Adepticon event without you. Of particular interest uh, and worthy of particular thanks, as I'm sure you've heard elsewhere in this episode, is Steven's releasing to us a cop- one copy each of Lost Temple and Revolver, the two newest games from Stronghold Games. So new, in fact, that they're not even available yet to anybody. The first place to check them out anywhere in the world will be uh, at our board game night. And if you're lucky, you could even win it and bring it home. Be the first person in the world to own it. How cool is that? So anyway, another big thanks to all those folks for making that happen and to the Adepticon Council for giving us this opportunity yet again. We hope to make it bigger and better than last year. Well, that's about all I've got for this episode. So thanks for listening and good night. Achievement unlocked! You've made it to the end of another D6 Generation episode, the podcast whose humor has universally been acclaimed as not too horrible. Please let us know what you thought of the show by either emailing us at info at the D6 Generation.com or by posting in our official D6G episode thread at the top of the DACA Discussions Forum on DACADACA.com. If for some inexplicable reason you actually enjoyed this show, you can help others find out about it by leaving positive reviews on iTunes. See you in two weeks. Thanks for listening, and happy gaming. The theme from Total Fangirl comes from the soundtrack of The Last Night on Earth, The Zombie Game, courtesy of Flying Frog Productions, and is a composition of Mary Beth Magalanes. There's a pause. You have to write the pause. I have to. You keep picking on me for that. Has that always been in there? (laughs) No, I added that this time because last time you picked on me. You talked, and now you've ruined the pause. I know. Now we have a blooper. See how it works? Were we recording? I said five, four, click, and then you went, there's a pause? (laughs) So this is now recorded. It's okay. That's why you have to write the pause down. That's where the blooper reels come from, folks. Right here. This is where it happens. I got to let the dog out before we have an accident, so I'll be right back. Is that what you call it now? Let the dog out before you have to go to the bathroom? Before I have an accident. All right.